a mysterious figure wearing a long trench coat, his hair hanging free and wild as it blows in the night's breeze, looks over his shoulder as he walks into a dark alley. Turning back around, he sees only shadows and trash strewn here and there. Three others follow him quietly, but he knows they are there hearing each footfall and their faint breathing. His eyes search for others looking for the trap they have set. The faintest blur of movement on the rooftops above is his only warning. They attack as a group, trying to overwhelm him before they believe he can react. Sidestepping the one that is leaping down from above, he thrusts his arm forward into his attacker's back. Bone and flesh are sliced through easily as his fingernails, like claws, pierce his target's heart. His attacker sputters for a moment, shock and pain covering his face. Blood froths forth from his mouth, dripping down his chest as the life leaves his eyes, and they become empty and cold as he falls to the ground as the stranger withdraws his arm. The others hesitate as they see their comrade fall all too suddenly. In that hesitation, the lonely figure strikes, taking advantage of the situation. Teeth bared, he sinks his fangs into the closest one's throat and brings him to the ground as he wrenches his neck, ripping his victim's throat open. The vampire clutches his throat, dying as his blood spurts forth and covers the asphalt around him. The other two turn to flee, but there is no escape. The last one doesn't even make it out of the alley as a blur of movement from the corner of his eye knocks him off his feet. A hand shoots out and grasps his throat. The hand of the stranger begins to crush his throat, eliciting pain and suffering from the vampire. He struggles to free himself, but does not have the strength to break the iron grip of the stranger. The vampire can hear his larynx being crushed and he tries to struggle one last time, desperation fueling his movements. His actions prove futile and only serve to make the situation worse. Now the hand grips even tighter, and he can hear flesh and cartilage be squished in a sickening wet sound. Pain shoots through his body and his vision starts to blur for a moment as blood begins to be cut off from his brain. Looking down, he sees the figure's face and knows that he will find no mercy there. The stranger's eyes look at him without a hint of compassion, only pure hatred. When he realizes that the more he struggles, the more the hand tightens, he soon gives up and accepts the dark void that awaits him. At this unexpected reaction, his killer pauses, as if hesitating, but it only lasts a moment. In a quick, jerking movement, the stranger snaps his neck. Tossing the body aside, Anthony's senses search for any more vampires. They thought to kill him with this ambush, but he proved to be far more than they bargained for. It had been two years since Anthony had left L.A. that fateful night. He had left all that he had loved behind to carry out his father's dream of destroying the vampire race. Creating others like him from vampires he found and chose to turn. Anthony taught them how to kill vampire their former comrades. Sadly, his hopes were misplaced in those he sired. The new blood drinkers became much like those Anthony hoped to wipe out. Instead of hunting down the vampires, most chose to live off them as parasites treating like cattle. They feed on only a few. Mostly those few vampires that were lost went unnoticed in the great scheme of things. Even if the rest suspected something, they could not find the cause. This was the same relationship that vampires had with humans. Those few who joined Anthony in his quest were now dead because they were too few in number and were overwhelmed by their prey just as they had tried to kill him earlier. The vampire had superior numbers while Anthony and his allies were but a few largely on their own and because it was difficult to coordinate their efforts. Hunting them down one by one the vampire had killed them. Anthony himself was strong enough to survive but just barely. He was now alone to fight his own war and knew that he was not enough. Now his cause was hopeless, even though he refused to give up, but Anthony soon found something else to worry about. It was Alexandra, the first one he had sired, who warned him that the council was after his family. After seeing the council's power when it set its mind to do something, he headed off to rescue his family. His mind went over their conversation and how different Alexandra seemed since he had first met her and turned her into the creature she was now. I will not make war with the others. 
They are far too many. Besides, your cause against the vampire race is useless, and you can hope to win. We survive by hiding in the shadows and striking quickly against a few of their number and disappearing. If they knew how of use there really are and where we were hiding, we would die just like those that joined you. Alexandra said, unable to look him in the eye. Turning her around so she was facing him, Anthony replied, If this is true, then why tell me this? You know I will not sit idly by while my family is in danger. My going to L.A. will only cause further trouble, and if the others learned of your involvement, you would still be in a lot of trouble. Why take the risk of telling me this? Finally looking into his eyes, Alexandra said, I don't know. All I can tell you is that I don't want to see you hurt in any shape or form. It was you who saved me when I was a vampire. If not for you, I would still have been living that life. Shaking his head in disgust, Anthony moved past her, his back now facing her as he said, So now you are a blood drinker of a different sort. Now it was Alexandra who forced herself into his view, moving in front of him. High words from one who has tasted the blood of vampire and taught me to drink of them as well. Alexandra said hurt at the accusation in his words. Looking directly into her eyes, Anthony responded, I have not drunk of their blood in a long time, though I have tasted it with all honesty. I taught you to drink, to heal yourself, and make yourself stronger if the time came that you would need it for your own survival. You and the others are no better the vampires I made you to hunt. Our paths are not yours to dictate. When we accepted your gift, we did so believing we would choose our own future. Does the one who sired us also now rule every aspect of who we are to become and what we shall do with the second chance given to us? You gave us this life and we thank you for it. Is not that enough? Can you not accept us as we are? Alexandra asked. She was right. It was wrong of him to ask so much of her. She had been the first of many. Into her, he had poured the teachings of free will. He had taught her all he knew and been hurt when she was forced to leave him because of their shared bond that appeared to drive all those he sired insane. Whenever one came too close to the other, they became more vicious and bloodthirsty, showing signs of the mental pain caused by their close proximity. In time, she learned to break their connections so she could visit him without suffering the effects. She alone out of his blood drinkers was capable of this, making her all the more special. I thank you for your warning. Do as you will on your chosen path. I care not. Farewell, Alexandra. I do not imagine we shall meet again on the same side. Anthony said, leaving her to make preparations for his journey. Alexandra watched him go finally letting the tears come. She had lied when she had said that. She didn't know why she had warned him. It truth it what had caused her to overcome the connection that had forced them apart. Alexandra loved him. Now it was that same love that caused her so much pain. She heard the frustration and defeat in his voice. His dream was crumbling around, and to make matters worse, his family was now being used against him. She should help him, but she was too afraid. The others were indeed dangerous, and she knew quite well that they had managed to tip the vampire off as to where Anthony's late supporters were. In her mind, this made them capable of anything. Alexandra cursed her own weakness at not be able to follow him. In hindsight, she believed that he should have sired none of the new blood drinkers that had not joined him. Those brave few who had shared in his dream had gladly given their lives. The rest of them, like herself, were simply cowards unwilling to help the person who had given them everything they had, and the others were willing to kill to protect themselves, even if it meant hurting Anthony. Alexandra wondered if she would ever change for the better, and if she did, would it be too late? These doubts tore at her, very soul bringing forth even more tears as she quietly sobbed alone in the night. Leaving his war behind him, he went back to L.A. with all speed. He was determined to let no harm come to his daughter Samantha, her husband Nicholas, and her child. He was greeted warmly by his daughter and was shown his grandson Tony. An adorable child, he shared traits from both his father and mother. Anthony played with his grandson, tickling him and playing peekaboo, while Samantha cooked dinner, waiting for Nicholas to make it home. 
He expected the three to come at any time and was surprised when a week passed and nothing. Going into the streets night after night, he searched for his enemy, wanting to strike first before they were prepared. During one of these patrols, he happened upon a creature that he had only read about in fairy tales, a werewolf. The beast had just finished off a vampire as he came upon a dark alley. The vampire had been trapped at the back of the alley, unable to escape. The vampire's body had mauled heavily and he was obviously dead. It was the scent of the vampire's blood that had led Anthony to this place. He dropped into unaware of the danger that lurked there in the darkness. The werewolf had remained motionless, no doubt, hearing his approach before he became aware of it. As he landed in a crouch, it attacked. Anthony cursed his recklessness. If he had paid more attention, he would have noticed the beast. Now it had the advantage of surprise and he was within easy striking distance. Its jaws clamped down on his arm, meaning to rip it off. Biting his attacker's snout, he caught it by surprise, causing it to let go as it yelped, pawing its face. Using the opportunity that had presented itself as it turned away trying to shake off the pain, he leapt on its back, biting it, and drank of its blood. Its strength mixed with his, giving him the edge he needed. His wounds quickly healed, and he began to feel stronger. Landing on his feet as he was tossed free, he leapt onto the fire escape above. When the werewolf tried to follow, his sharp fingernails drew blood as he sliced into its face, barely missing its eyes. Howling in pain, the beast fell to the pavement below, blinded by its own blood. Leaping up, yet again, he caught the edge of the roof and pulled himself up easily. Grasping a brick chimney, he ripped it from its purchase, still feeling the power of the werewolf's blood coursing through his veins. Carrying it to the edge, he threw it down into the alley below. A shower of brick and mortar struck the werewolf, burying it underneath. Anthony was about to leave, believing his enemy dead and defeated when heard the groaning of a woman. Stepping to the edge, he looked down into the alley. Barely sticking out of the rumble was a human hand. Leaping down so as to not land on the pile, he made his way to the hand. Her fingers were barely moving, but she was still alive. Digging through the rumble with his hands, he unburied the naked form of a young woman. Wrapping her in his trench coat, he started to leave the alley and noticed clothes and a wallet to his left on the ground. He had no doubt that these were her clothes. Her picture in the wallet he found during his search of the pockets only served to confirm this. The unlucky vampire had no doubt fallen into a trap she had set. Anthony himself had barely escaped. Life as it seemed was getting more difficult. Using her address on the front of her driver's license, he found her home address near the docks. Setting her down on a couch, he looked around. The outside might have been an old warehouse, but the inside was very nice living quarters. This woman, whoever she was, living it up. Anthony felt a high he had not felt before as he stood there in the middle of the room. He had trouble focusing as the world spun around him and his body began to burn up. Ripping off his clothes, he tried desperately to cool himself. The werewolf's blood was like a drug, and he became delirious with its power. Time and the world around him faded into the background, and he closed his eyes, enjoying the feeling. Suddenly, pain twisted through his body as his muscles spasmed and relaxed, then spasmed again, and his bones began to set themselves into new positions. Hair began to sprout out of his skin until he had a thick fur coat covering him. A mirror that hung in the bathroom showed his wolf-like features. They were the same features he had seen in Katrina earlier before she changed into her human form. With a degree of mental effort, he changed back to human form, picturing what he had looked like before the change. Covered in sweat, he looked at the woman to see if she was awake. She still seemed to be fast asleep on the couch. Retrieving her wallet from the pocket in his overcoat, he put it back in her pants pocket. As he tried to rise again, he found he did not have the strength, the pain and exhaustion weighing down his shoulders. His eyes closed up. He passed out on the floor, falling into a deep sleep. When he awoke, Katrina was standing over him. How is it that you are not dead? No vampire can survive after drinking the blood of a werewolf. Katrina said, studying him. Rising to a sitting position, he said, 
While I might share a number of their chromosomes, we are not the same. I was made to kill them. I am something different than either of your species. Looking into his eyes, Katrina saw his sincerity and knew there was truth in his words. How were you made then? Katrina asked. She could not help her curiosity. His honesty surprised her as well as his mercy. Normally her enemies would be ready to kill her if they had the opportunity he had been given last night. Granted that was the first time it had actually happened to her, but still she was curious why this man had not. When he told her how he was made, she was shocked. And yet as she thought about it more and more, it made sense. Looking at him, considering all these facts, she found him quite attractive. He was after all not really a vampire, and he had shown great ability in their confrontation last night. It had been some time since Katrina had been bested. Only her first mate Lucius had been able to do so and with a lot more trouble than this one. If nothing else, he could prove amusing. As she drew close, Katrina heard his heartbeat increase. His recent change had made his mind and body more susceptible to her and her charms. His body surged with adrenaline and new pheromones began to be produced. When Katrina sniffed the air, her body grew more excited. For werewolves, scent was very important. It told others of their place in the hierarchy in the pack and promoted them to possible mates. Anthony's scent showed him to be a powerful alpha male, the rarest and strongest of their males. Never before had she smelt something so exhilarating. Her body and mind were going wild with her desire to touch him and feel his well-muscled form against hers. Like a wild animal, she leapt forward like a predator on its quarry and planted a kiss on his lips as he fell backwards from his sitting position. His urgency, driven by some insatiable need, quickly matched hers as they rolled around on the floor. Katrina closed her eyes, enjoying his kisses as he pressed her to the floor, using the full weight of his body. When it was over, she lay exhausted and trembling, but she had little time to recuperate as she saw the look in his eyes again. When Anthony finally left her, she lay passed out on the bed, her naked body laying underneath the covers, a great smile of satisfaction on her face. Anthony felt more invigorated than he had in his entire life. Perhaps now, with this new blood mixed into his veins, a balance could exist. Maybe he could finally find peace with himself and live a more normal life. Desperately, he clung to this hope, praying to God that it could be so. Heading back into the city, Anthony decided to test out some of his new abilities. Focusing the image of a wolf, he changed before wandering the streets. In this form, he found that he still was able to think like his former self, but still have the advantages of that his wolf form could offer. As he rounded one corner, he sensed a familiar presence. It was Leah, and he sensed she was in danger. When he found her, she was surrounded by four vampire as they began to close in on her. Outnumbered, Leah was forced into a defensive position as she backed into the alley. None of the vampire noticed Anthony, so he was able to approach without warning and attack one of them from behind, aiming for the back of his neck. Leaping, he sunk his teeth into one of the vampires, bringing him to the ground and breaking his neck. The rest now alerted to his presence, whirled around one hissed, as Anthony attacked, snarling loudly. Ripping his throat out with his teeth, Anthony turned to face the others. One of them drew a large knife, and while the other used a large metal pipe to attack him from two sides, as Anthony tried to get his bearings. The pipe smashed for his head, forcing him to dodge, but Anthony unknowingly dodged right into the path of the stabbing knife. Yelping, Anthony bit into the still outstretched arm of the vampire who had wounded him. Biting into his face, Anthony clamped down, breaking the vampire's face and ripping off the skin. Blood and gore were exposed as the vampire lay bleeding to death, groaning in agony before meeting his end. The last one was finished off by Leah as he focused on the wounded wolf readying his next swing. Grabbing a broken piece of wood she found on the ground, Leah stabbed him in the back. The knife was still stuck in Anthony's side as he tried to remove it, tired of the pain it was causing him. During one of those tries, a sharp stab of pain from his efforts caused him to lose consciousness and the world became dim. Anthony awoke in an all-too-familiar surroundings. 
Looking down at himself, he saw that he was now in human form again. His wound had been bandaged expertly by caring hands. It was late evening already, so he must have slept through most of the following day. He heard Leah's footsteps as she approached the guest room he had been staying in. Changing back into his wolf form, he laid down, trying to act like he was still resting. Opening the Leah entered the room. Kneeling down, she was dressed in a gray t-shirt and a pair of sweats with fluffy white bunny slippers, peeking through slitted eyelids. Anthony was glad his current form didn't allow him to chuckle or smile at this image of Leah. Leaning closer, Leah smiled, saying, You're a sneaky rascal peeking like that. Anthony, knowing he had been caught red-handed, opened his eyes fully. Getting up slowly, he sat on his hind legs, looking up at her, his tongue hanging out and his tail wagging. I'm surprised you can get up at all. Here, let me see how your wound is healing, Leah said, moving to check the bandage. Anthony growled at her, showing he did not like that idea. Slowly withdrawing, Leah chuckled, saying, Okay, I guess you don't want your wound messed with just like my old dog, Max. He was the same way. One day we were hunting when a bear attacked. Max, as aggressive and protective as he was, attacked the bear when it threatened me. He managed to keep the old bear busy until my dad sighted the bear with his gun and fired, killing it. But not before Max had taken some licks in the scrape. I remember him snapping and growling at Dad every time one of those scratches were touched. It got so bad that we had to put a makeshift muzzle on him using sheets, and we tied his front paws together so he couldn't loosen it. He eventually got better, but I never forgot what he did for me, and always was there to give him a good scratch or feed him some of my table scraps when he wanted it. Come to think of it, you are the spitting image of him. For a moment there in the alley, I thought old Max had come back to help from the grave. Leah noticed Anthony's ears poke up when she mentioned the name Max. Do you like that name, boy? You want that to be your name? Leah asked, reaching out, pet him. Anthony let her stroke him, and he licked her hand before nuzzling up against her. Laughing, Leah said, In that case, Max, it is then. Well, you rest now, boy, and I'll be back soon. Anthony waited until she left before leaving himself. Realizing he was now naked, he decided to stay in his wolf form until he was able to find his clothes not far from where he had found Leah. Putting them back on, he made his way back to his daughter's apartment building, wanting to check in on her. Samantha's apartment was on the third floor, but the elevator stopped on the second. When no one entered, he grew interested, but decided it must be a glitch and didn't step out to see the cause. The doors closed and he went up to Samantha's room. The following night he headed out on patrol and was turning a corner on a dark street when an invisible force lifted him off his feet and slammed him into the building behind him. Pressed against the wall he could hardly move when he heard a feminine voice, Hello Anthony, my name is Namaya. I have been waiting for you. Stepping into view a gorgeous black-haired woman dressed in a sports jacket and pants came into view. Her skin was a brown tan, though it was no doubt more pale now than it had been before she had been turned. Showing off her new clothes, Namaya posed for him. Do you like it? I wanted to fit in more easily. I am not accustomed to such clothing, but I find these quite comfortable, Namaya said, turning around to show off him the back and more of her nice figure. What do you want, vampire? Anthony asked. Namaya frowned at his rudeness, disliking it. You needn't be so hostile. I have not come to harm you. I wanted to see you. I have studied you for some time, even before you killed Amek. Actually, you could say I have watched you since the day you were born. Quite frankly, I expected more. You managed to kill Amek, yet you are trapped by the mind of one who could not defeat him. Perhaps it was simply brute force and luck that allowed you to accomplish what so many others failed to do, Namaya said. In her overconfidence, Namaya strayed too close as taunted him. In a flash, Anthony's right arm shot out, breaking her concentration as he grabbed her. Lifting her up, he smashed her into the wall he had been pressed against only a moment before holding her there. Anthony gave a low, guttural growl as he held Namaya up, her back pressed hard against the wall. His grip was like a vice, allowing no escape. 
To his surprise, Nehemiah laughed. You learn quickly, my young believer. Such a powerful mind and such a fine specimen of a body. Her soft, silky hands rubbed the length of the arm that held her. The touch thrilled him to his core. Anthony was shocked at the strength of how she had affected him and by her unusual behavior. He was now unsure of how to react and was now deeply confused. His mouth could not form any words as he stared at her, speechless. Normally his enemies reacted with fear or open defiance, perhaps even submission in the end not like this. He was unprepared for such an unusual reaction. Taking advantage of the possible opening, Namaya said, you have defeated the strongest that the vampire race had to offer. None of us can destroy you for fear of wiping out the whole species. What are you babbling about and how to know so much about me? Anthony asked, regaining his composure. Smiling charmingly, Namaya said, I would be happy to tell you more, but first I must humbly ask that you spare my life. Shaking her violently, Anthony said with emphasis, you are living on borrowed time, vampire. Speak or suffer the consequences. If you want my knowledge, you have but two ways to do so. The first is to listen what I have to say, something I am hardly inclined to do in this position. The second is to drain me of blood down to the last drop, but of course you won't do that. Namaya said a smirk on her face. What makes you so sure I won't choose the second option? Anthony asked. Chuckling, Namaya replied, you hate to drink blood. It was what caused you to leave the blood drinkers you created, your adopted children and companions stolen from our very ranks. They not only kill vampires, but drink their blood as well, just as many of my kind do to humans. You could not stomach that, so you left them. While her words ran true, Anthony could not help but be infuriated by them. Namaya continued not overly concerned with his apparent anger. Strange is it not that you would defeat Amak and take his place of kingship. Now we are connected to you just as we were once connected to him. Some of us, including myself, longed for his death, but could not be the cause of it. In the end, even if we could manage it, we didn't for fear of killing all of us. Yes, Anthony, I know you four. I have waited for you all my immortal life, ever since Amak forced me into this one. I live day by day by the blood of others, me the daughter of a respected priest of my tribe. Amak chose me because my innocence and beauty and enjoyed every moment of my corruption. I watched you grow up hoping you were the one to end it all. The others did not believe me, but here you stand living and breathing when Amak's ashes are scattered across the earth. When you killed him, you took his place in the great web. Now, our survival depends on your continued existence. We are connected to, you know, for better or for worse. Shaking her head, Namaya said, but now a deeper threat looms. Even as those who share my belief grow number without the threat of Amak awakening and hunting us down, a war is brewing. As much as I hated Amak, I must admit he was feared and respected by his rivals. Now, without him to protect us, the hunters and the werewolf are rallying themselves to attack us. Our enemies perceive weakness and mean to finish us off once and for all. More and more vampires are moving here, believing you can save them. They are desperate for your leadership, even though you were once their enemy. And rightfully so. If both these enemies attack at once, the vampire race will be wiped out. You forgot another side to the conflict the blood drinkers I created. They will follow the vampire as predators follow the herds they prey on. Soon they will be here as well, further thinning your numbers. They might try to stop the others for their own selfish ends, so they may continue to feed on you. But if these two enemies are as deadly as you say, they too will be overwhelmed. Still, why should I care? You said it yourself. We are enemies. Anthony said, not feeling least bit of pity for the vampire. Good riddance as far as he was concerned, they would finally be wiped off the face of the earth. Because we are willing to follow your guidance from now on. If we survive this coming war, you could change our ways, saving many human lives in the long run. Besides, what will do you think will happen to you, precious humans? They will be caught in the crossfire and many will die, and those who do not will be turned by all but the hunters in effort to increase that side's strength. 
What of your friend Santiago? Has he not proven a true friend? He has hidden your daughter and her family from the council up until now. If it weren't for his efforts, they would have actually captured her instead of luring you here into a trap. Even now, he watches over them for your sake. If there was any place that you might decide to take a stand, it would be here where all the people you care about live. The council knows that just as I do. They are not fools, Anthony. They know you are our only hope and will do whatever they can to encourage you to save them, Namaya said. All my life, I struggled against my bloodthirsty nature trying to become the human son my father tried to make after his irrevocable error. He tried to make me into something I could not possible be after I was born. By then it was already too late. Despite all my efforts and his, my nature and the threat I represented to others always came back to haunt me. It even cost me the life of wife Elena and years of my daughter Samantha's life. I have always hated myself for that. Every day I think how much better the world would have been if I had not been born. Now you tell me I have just made it worse by killing Amak, who threatened those I cared for. I am done, Namaya, done trying to change the world now. I only want peace. Let the war come. I will do my best not to let it spill into the streets. Perhaps this time I will be fortunate and you will kill each other," Anthony said in anger and determination. Do you think you hold your own private corner on pain? I was a new bride once my husband and I had just been married. I was mortal then happy and carefree. Before we could consummate our marriage, Amic entered our home and killed my husband before my eyes. I could only weep for my dying love as Amic turned me. You are not alone in your pain, Anthony. There are others like me with similar stories. We have all suffered. Who are you to choose whether one's suffering is greater than another's? Are you God that you should make such judgments? What do you know of God, Namaya? Anthony asked. During my first years living as I, Vampire, I prayed for help. I prayed for any help that would allow me to regain the life I had lost, living life as a mortal again, even if it were a short life. When this failed, I prayed for absolution for a chance to redeem myself and end my suffering and have the peace of death. But this too was denied me. Amik saw all and laughed as he took hope again and again from me and God did nothing. Not one prayer was answered. Not one desire was met. I cannot even enter his house anymore without my skin burning. Nor can I stand in the light of the sun that he created. My faith crumbled to dust long ago. Only your youth and inexperience protects you from such a fate now. You are wrong. It is one of the few things I have left from my father. To me, the cross does not burn, nor does stepping into a church or sunlight. I do not share your anger towards him. If not for human interference, the drugs that were killing my mother would have killed me, and I would be at peace in heaven. Do not blame God for your misfortune. He did not choose this life for you. Amek did. Without allowing evil to exist, what is the choice? Anthony replied. Easy for you to say. You have the advantages of both human and vampire. Even now, our power flows to you, and you could use it if you only wished to claim it. Amik described it to me many times as if taunting me with it. You connected to the great web as he described it. You can sense not only the thoughts of other vampires, but where they are in the world, if you focus, Namaya said. Hesitantly, Anthony tried to sense the web closing his eyes. Part of him didn't believe her, but still he tried. His mind began to drift unconcerned with what lay around him, focusing on the web. Soon he began to see and could feel its power coursing to him. Only his lack of experience with it kept him from using it easily. For now, it was elusive and slipped through his grasp. It was then as only a thin strand of consciousness held him to his body when the beast struck. Using the opening Anthony had provided, it gripped him trying to seize control. His face and body froze in a giant spasm as Anthony tried to fight the beast off. His eyes closed of their own volition as he felt his control slip. As quickly as the spasm had appeared, it was gone. When his eyes had reopened, his vision had gone red as his eyes filled with blood. 
A feral smile showed a new set of teeth covered in his own blood. The second set was longer than the others and was razor sharp. The old set was set in between giving him two sets of piercing teeth. Anthony himself was not in control. The beast was and Namaya had no idea the danger she was in. It was not until his teeth sunk into her neck that she knew something was different. At first she gasped in pain but that sensation quickly passed. What replaced it was a feeling of poor ecstasy. Something in his bite made her forget everything and concentrate on that feeling. A biological chemical mixed with her blood as his saliva entered her bloodstream spreading the chemical throughout her body. It heightened her perception of the experience causing her to close her eyes with a content drowsiness. Namaya no longer carried about anything except never letting go of this feeling. Wrapping her arms around his neck, she allowed him to deepen the bite, welcoming it. She could feel her life ebbing, but didn't care. She wanted to exist in this moment as long as possible. It was Anthony who saved her using logic. He convinced the beast not to kill her. It she lived. Then she could produce more delicious blood, for her blood was sweeter than any he had ever tasted. Another reason would be the other vampires would seek revenge on the one who killed her and this would be significant threat to him. The beast, having gained what it wanted, relinquished its control, satisfied for the moment. It dropped the limp form of Namaya, no longer interested in her. Anthony immediately grabbed the reins, putting himself back in control. When he opened his eyes, his blood-soaked vision was gone. Looking down at Namaya, she seemed so lifeless. Her heart was weakening from the loss of blood, its once steady beat was beginning to falter and wane. Kneeling near her, Anthony lifted her up, cradling her in one arm. Biting into the wrist of the other, he let the blood drip into her mouth. It was difficult to feed her the life-giving fluid, as he had to keep reopening the skin as his body kept closing it, trying to heal itself. It apparently was a side effect of his recent change in body chemistry. Slowly but surely, the new blood brought her back to life. Now she slept soundly, apparently unharmed, but still tired. As he lifted her up, Anthony could help but notice how light she was. If he had given her any more, she would no longer be a vampire, but more like him. He had created too many of them to want to create another blood drinker. He was no longer naive enough to believe they would do anything but create more destruction in pursuit of their own selfish ends. Looking down at Namaya so peaceful and helpless, he decided to find somewhere safe for her to stay. This would most likely be in the company of other vampers. He felt it was worth the possible risk to himself to see her safe after all. He was responsible for her current condition. Carrying her through the city streets, he searched for a grouping of vampires. He hoped that he would be able to find them while remaining downwind. Had he not been so worried by his charge, he would have liked to wander the streets as he did every night recently, listening to the city's sounds and see the sights. He had forgotten how much he enjoyed such simple pursuits, and how much he wanted to take them up again and forget the coming war. Anthony desired peace in this part of his life somewhere, where there were no worries, no dangers to keep him distracted from paying attention to the little things. Anthony was so distracted by these thoughts that he did not notice the wind shift. He also did not even notice the vampires until he heard a rusting on the rooftops above him. Seeing their silhouettes, he knew he was well outnumbered. Setting down Nemia, he hoped she would be safe. Any hope of surviving was bleak at best. Angry and frustrated at himself for allowing himself to be put in this position, Anthony did not stop the beast as tried to take control. As one vampire leapt towards him, his teeth bared. Anthony speared him on his fingernails. Grasping the bleeding vampire with his other hand, Anthony freed his left and tossed him aside, not even looking at him as he died. The second vampire had his throat slashed as he too attacked, leaving him crumpling to the ground, gripping the open wound. The rest of the vampires leapt at once, counting on their numbers to bear him down. Angry at the loss of their two brethren, and at the capture of their queen, they were determined to kill the trespasser. Like a wriggling mass, they bit into him and tried to drain him. Enraged Anthony initiated the change. This time the change was easy and smooth. 
Within seconds, he had assumed his werewolf form. A huge behemoth, he burst upward, throwing the vampires off. Before they could recover, he was upon them and had cut off the entrance to the alley. The first vampire who got brave found it was unwise to make a break for it as Anthony sunk his teeth into her. She barely had enough time to scream before two claws gripped her, ripping her in half with one mighty heave. The next vampire who ventured too close was quickly clamped in his jaws. With a jerk of his head, he broke the vampire's neck. The vampires were now desperate to get away from him after finding themselves the prey. The rest tried to climb their way out of the alley. One leapt for the fire escape, trying to get to safety, dropping the body of his last victim. Anthony charged forward, biting into one of his dangling legs. The vampire screamed as he was ripped from his purchase and smashed into the wall, shattering his skull. Another vampire tried to make a break for it, picking up a metal pipe to defend himself. He ran forward as fast as he could. With one quick swipe of his clawed hand, he caved in his head and sent him flying into the others before he could bring the pipe up to strike in his own defense. Blood continued to flow in the dark alley until all the vampires except Namaya were dead. Changing into his human form, Anthony left the alley with Namaya in his arms. Finding an abandoned building, he laid her on the floor inside as there was no furniture that he could see. She awoke then and reached for him. Against his better judgment, he let her pull him down to the floor beside her. She kissed him and Anthony responded in kind. Their coupling was brief and gentle, for Namaya was still weak. She was fast asleep by the time he left. Quietly, he snuck out and went back through the carnage in the alley where he witnessed his own handiwork as he stepped over what was left. Wanting to leave the bloody scene behind, Anthony chose to head to the safety of Leah's house. As he approached the front of the house, he saw a doggy door. Heading to the bushes so as to give him cover, he changed into his wolf form. Trotting across the lawn, he bent down and slipped on through. It was a good fit. Apparently, she had taken his measurements as he slept. Hearing him enter, Leah entered the living room from the kitchen to greet him. Well, hello there, fella. I guess I was right that you might want to come back here eventually. What do you think of the door? Leah asked, crouching down in front of him. In response, Anthony nuzzled her with his nose while wagging his tail, nearly bowling her over. Laughing, Leah said, I'll take that as a sign of approval. Want to watch some TV, boy? With that, she stood up and made her way to the couch and sat down. Following her, Anthony hopped up onto the couch, laying his head on her lap. Smiling, Leah scratched him behind one of his ears, causing him to close his eyes in enjoyment. Despite all the things that had happened, he enjoyed this quiet time. It brought him the peace he longed for, even if it was just for a little while. In this form, he could finally do what he wanted to do. Last time, he was in Los Angeles. Protect Leah. Perhaps if he stayed like this, no more people would be hurt. Not once in this shape had he lost control. This was his chance at refuge, to cause no more harm to anyone else. Here was a chance to not become the monster of his nightmares. It was his last hope. Without it, he had nothing else to hold on to. He awoke in the middle of the night after experiencing an eerie feeling. Sniffing the air, he smelled something familiar. Slipping out the doggy door, he sat on the porch staring at Katrina accompanied by her entourage as they walked up the driveway. It took some time to track you, Anthony. You have become very good at hiding your trail. I'm honestly impressed. Katrina said, smiling with approval. What is your purpose here, Katrina? I thought I was just a passing fancy. Anthony said. To a human, the sounds he emitted while in wolf form would have meant nothing, but to a werewolf it was clear as day. I have come for you, Anthony, not your charge. Perhaps while we talk at a more private location, most of my people here could watch after the person you are protecting. No harm will come to her as long as they are around you have my word, Katrina replied. Anthony could hardly find fault in the offer. Katrina was offering six bodyguards to protect Leah. The fact that they were werewolves made him feel even more certain that Leah would be well protected with them. As he shifted into human form, one of Katrina's men quickly moved forward, wrapping Anthony in an overcoat to cover his nakedness. 
Anthony caught Katrina lingering gaze as her eyes still pictured him without the benefit of clothes. Looking away as their eyes met, he stepped off the porch towards the group of werewolves. Together, Anthony and Katrina headed to the limousine parked out front. The largest of the bodyguards detached himself from the group and opened and closed the door for them, allowing them to slide in before heading towards the driver's seat. Katrina said his name was Taulus. Taulus stood at about 6'2". His build was huge and menacing. Anthony did not doubt most people would have been intimidated by his appearance. However, Anthony wasn't scared of him at all. Though he might look bigger in reality, Anthony was the stronger of the two. The fact that he walked tough almost made Anthony laugh. He had never found such a thing necessary. Why advertise your strength in a walk when it was far more effective to strike without warning others of your ability? The results were far better his way. This he had learned from experience. Those few times he had been forced to fight growing up had sealed his rep from schools to school. Only one bully would be dumb enough to take him on when he showed up at a new school, and the rest learned from his mistake. Anthony's fighting style had always been vicious and to the point. He had never been proud of the way he had fought, but in reality, it probably had stopped many others from happening. Strange that he would reflect on the violence that had been so much a part of his life at a time like this. Anthony began to wonder if such things were normal among humans, or was he just different in this matter? As he stepped into the car, he tried to turn his mind towards Katrina and wonder exactly what she wanted. The way she smiled at him caused him to feel nervous. He disliked the idea of someone undressing him with their eyes. He was unaccustomed to such things. The fact that she was moving closer wasn't helping. You honestly believe that you were just a fancy? That I chose you because you caught my eye for that mere moment? Katrina said, looking into his eyes. Anthony thought he saw a hurt look in her eyes. Feeling shame at his earlier words as he saw how it was affecting her, Anthony said, I'm sorry. My experiences with women, particularly in recent events, are not very good. I have fallen into the habit of being very defensive around them. I apologize if I offended you. It was not my intent. Reaching out to stroke his long hair that gave Anthony his wild, uncivilized look, Katrina said, you needn't worry about that with me. I know how to treat a man such as you. At this comment, Anthony blushed, shying away from her. Katrina giggled at this, for it was both unexpected and adorable to her. Katrina could not help but fall more and more in love with this man. This did not surprise her very much. Anthony was a complex individual hidden behind. Iron-faced veneer was a man who was unconfident around women. If he realized what he was capable of easily catching their attention, if he really tried this might change. But she loved his shyness and humility in this regard. Besides, once properly prompted, he could powerful and magnetic. The thought of their last encounter was still a warm and pleasant memory in her mind. Anthony, despite his lack of efforts to make himself so, was a beautiful man. He had been blessed by good bone structure as well as an excellent build. If he put in little effort, most women would turn their heads, their eyes trained on him if they passed him in the street. The goodness in his soul made him even more attractive despite what he was dealing with. She could not imagine the emotional turmoil he was under. No one had been faced with the effect of three species in one's blood and each of their own qualities and drawbacks. Anthony looked out the window as the limousine pulled away from the curb. While his attention seemed to be directed elsewhere, Katrina took the opportunity to scoot closer. Anthony immediately sensed that she had moved closer. Looking at her out of the corner of her eye, he scooted away. When she continued to move closer, he was forced into the far side of the seat, pressing him up against the window. He now had no more room to move away from her. Smiling, she felt the same pleasure she did after trapping an elusive prey. Katrina could smell his sweat as she moved in for a kiss. Pressing her lips tightly against his, she moved onto his lap, her hands moving towards the belt of his overcoat, loosening it with nimble fingers. 
The driver, wanting to give his queen a little privacy, pressed the button to roll up the glass barrier between them, hiding them from view. The police had classified it as an animal attack, but Timothy was not so sure. When he studied the blood samples that he had collected, it was clear that this was no ordinary animal. Twenty vampires were not normally easy prey. Whatever had killed them had to be very powerful. Apparently, the vampires had managed to wound the creature. As he studied their killer's blood, he saw something strange. Santiago had taught him all he knew about identifying vampire and their mortal enemy, the werewolf. This sample seemed to be a mixture of the two. At first, he thought the sample was contaminated, but as he studied the DNA further, he saw it belonged to the same individual. Picking up the phone, Timothy dialed Santiago. You mean this Anthony was that creature that saved Leah? Paul asked in disbelief in Santiago's office later on that night. Yes, he was. Amazing, isn't it, that he survived the fire that caused his burns? Santiago said with his usual calm. Do you know what caused the fire that did that to him? Paul asked, his mind reeling. What was he doing back in L.A.? Obviously, he must have had a good reason for leaving, so why return? Paul asked himself. I should. I started the fire, Santiago said. The shock was evident on Paul's face as Santiago continued speaking. Mary, as you may remember, sired me. After our falling out, we parted company. When she wanted to get rid of Anthony, seeing him as no longer useful, she sent him after me. Mary knew quite well I would notice him following me. Anthony had no idea he was being set up, nor would he have cared at the time. He had gotten into the habit of using drugs to wipe away the loss of his wife and child. Little did he know Samantha, his daughter, had managed to survive, but that is another story. Anthony had a death wish, and I, believing he was just a hired assassin, was happy to oblige. I led him into a dark alley and waited on top of a building overlooking that alleyway. I had managed to lose him in the sewers long enough to soak the ground below with fuel. He did not realize the danger he was in until I lit a match and tossed it down. The alley burst into flame engulfing him. How exactly he survived when anyone else wouldn't have I don't know. What your friend Leah saw was the first part of his metamorphosis. His mind and body now realized their potential and began to grow as they were supposed to. We are now looking at the final stage of his transformation. When it is finished, few will be safe from him. They will be those he considers the same as him or those who could become like him. If you don't fit into either category, you're as good as food to him, and he'll drain you dry without a second thought. How do you know so much about him? Paul asked. I studied the diaries his father made. I saw what the good doctor could not. He was blinded by his need for vengeance and later by his love for his adopted son. Handing over the copies of the diaries he had given Anthony, he said, Look for yourself, and you will see... I speak the truth. Connor Burroughs was a genius to accomplish what he did, but he did not bother to think of all the possible consequences. His failing has put all of us who remain in this world in grave danger. Can anything stop him? Paul asked. Shaking his head, Santiago replied, not when the change is complete. Ironically, he may prove the greatest cause for peace. We will have to unite just to fend him off. I thought you said nothing could stop him, Paul said. Physically, he will be invincible, but one hope remains, his love for his daughter, Samantha. If she stands firm and does not succumb, she may hold the key to save us. United, we may buy the time she needs. Santiago answered. Paul couldn't believe what he was hearing. You would place our destinies on this one woman. Do you even know her well enough that you place such great trust in her abilities and integrity? Paul said. I do indeed. She is her father's daughter, but without the perversion of the evil that exists in a vampire. We could all become possible Anthonys in our hearts, but she is different. She is pure, and that is why her husband and father protect her. They don't want her to lose any more of her innocence. Santiago said. Paul now understood Santiago's plan. It was a long shot, but it was the only one they had. 
Daniel Hunter roamed the streets of Los Angeles under a clear night sky. Spotting his quarry below, he pulled an arrow from the quiver on his back. Notching it, he drew back the bowstring, taking careful aim. Taking a deep breath, he held it and fired. The arrow flew true, striking the guard at the door, in the heart killing him. Daniel exhaled, taking stock of the situation. His senses strained to catch even a hint of an alarm being raised. When he was satisfied that no one had seen the vampire die, he moved in taking his time so no one would notice his approach. He never relaxed, despite fact this was as natural as breathing. It took an effort for him not to sneak around like he was doing now. It was one of the reasons he had been chosen. Daniel was the hunter, a title that made him special in the secret group called the Huntsman. They were an order almost as old as vampires and werewolves themselves. Created to fight the forces of evil they did, as their name suggested, they hunted down all who might threaten humanity. Some, such as Santiago or Daniel himself, would argue that they did so indiscriminately. Daniel had been ordered to kill beings who did not fit the term of evil. Some had managed to coexist with humans or separated themselves from them so as not to harm them. They had lived peaceful lives until the elders of the huntsmen had told him to exterminate them. For being supposedly being such monsters, those select few had died much the same as he imagined humans would. Their faces still haunted his dreams, causing him many sleepless nights. Turning his attention to the task at hand, he pushed those thoughts aside along with his guilt. Clearing the building room by room, he killed four more vampires as they slept, preparing for sunrise in two hours. This done, he left the scene, making sure to take a series of twists and turns to lose anyone that might be following him, as he had been trained to do. It was not long until he arrived at his rented apartment. Hiding his weapons in a gym bag hidden on the roof of a nearby building, he entered his own apartment building and made his way upstairs. Daniel dialed a number on his house phone that he had memorized, not trusting notes. He made sure to report in as he set down his gym bag next to the desk. The voice on the other end was Donovan Head of the Elders. How did your mission go? Donovan asked. It is done, sir. None of them escaped from the building. Daniel answered. Good, I have another task for you. We have tracked one of the new blood drinkers that are different from the ones we have seen before. This one lives in L.A. The address is, Donovan said, giving Daniel the direction to the creature's home. These missions Daniel hated the most. As far as he was concerned, the new blood drinkers killed other vampires, which was good riddance as far as Daniel was concerned. Not one had been recorded to have ever killed a human. Thus he saw little point in killing them. In a way, they were doing Daniel a favor since they were more of these new ones than him. The vampires were so focused on wiping them out instead of killing him that it made his job all that easier. For a time, it seemed like the bloodsuckers were catching up to the huntsmen. Perhaps even he, as the last, the hunters would have become the prey. Systematically, the vampires had begun to trace the huntsmen, tracking those who were not wary enough until they finally caught up with them. Daniel had seen pictures of the aftermath and had been there to see the body bags. These new blood drinkers had granted the huntsman a reprieve. In Daniel's opinion, his organization should be thanking them instead of hunting them like the rest. Unfortunately, Daniel didn't get to make that distinction, and orders were orders. If he didn't carry them out, someone more inept would. Such a thing would get both Homan and Blue Drinker killed if they were lucky. The other possibility was only the Homan did. Daniel had enough experience in the field to know that one screw-up could very well be your last. Most of the creatures they were hunting, good or bad, wouldn't give them a second chance. They knew that at least after the first attempt that their life was now on the line. Daniel couldn't really blame them. If he were in their place, he wouldn't want to go out easy either, but would want to take as many as he could with him before the end. Daniel was better prepared to handle these types of situations, though it would not be easy mentally or physically. These new ones were tougher than the vampires he had hunted for years and far more aware of their surroundings to boot. One had sensed him coming, and had nearly killed Daniel in the scuffle that followed. He had spent weeks recuperating from broken bones suffered during fighting for his life before he managed to stake the creature in the heart. 
Daniel had gotten better hunting them since then, so that didn't really happen anymore, but it still hurt like hell fighting one of them. These new ones didn't die like the others. The old ones, it was one stab through the heart and it was over. But this new batch was a different story. Sometime it took three or four to finish them off and with them, biting and clawing madly the entire time as they fought to survive. In some cases, he had been forced to hack the new ones to pieces, which was gritty work. They died like humans, or werewolves, bloody and gory, crying out the entire time. Vampires, on the other hand, and when compared to the other two groups, once you knew where to strike, you could kill them quick and clean with very little fuss. The huntsmen had to establish cleanup teams to dispose of the bodies of the new blood drinkers. The only good thing was, these new ones rarely existed as more than two individuals in one city. They purposely separated themselves for some reason. Why they did this, most of his people didn't care, but Daniel did. If you studied your enemy, you knew how to better defeat them. Most of his superiors did not like this way of thinking because, as you got to know certain individuals, it became harder to kill them when the time came. Daniel still believed he had learned some valuable information that he had passed up the chain, despite their dislike of his practices. First was the reason why there was usually only one per city. He had observed that these new ones became agitated within certain proximity of each other. He had seen one new one, who had tried to enter a city stop for a moment, bare his teeth in the moonlight, snarling, and mysteriously turn around. When Daniel discovered soon afterward that another one was already present there, he put two and two together. It seemed to be their one weakness. As a group, they could easily kill off the vampire or anyone else if they chose to, but they had to keep a distance from each other. He had not been able to discover how this had come about, but knowing the what he knew already was enough for now and served his purposes. They also appeared to be able to move in daylight, Daniel had documented several occurrences of this. These observations had aided the huntsmen in tracking the new ones. Sometimes they would just have to track one of them, and that one would tell them where the others were by simply watching to see which cities that one entered. This one was located in a house outside the city, in a suburb of L.A. It made the job more difficult as one feared being discovered by watchful neighbors. Night would be the best time because less of those neighbors might be awake and perhaps the creature might be sleeping as well. Other than hunting or just enjoying themselves, these new ones preferred the daylight like humans to walk around in. The lights were on in the living room, but not the rest of the house. Perhaps this one was asleep and still home. Sneaking towards the door, he saw a doggy door built into it. Daniel hoped the dog didn't hear him and alert her. That wish proved to be in vain as her pet slipped outside at that very moment, placing himself between Daniel and the house. The dog's tail wagged and his tongue hung loosely from his mouth. Not wanting to kill the animal, he tried to shoo it away, but it refused to move. Sighing, he saw no other choice but to kill it. This wolf dog would likely give off some noise, informing its master that someone was nearby, and he couldn't afford to take that chance. Daniel pulled out his bow and began reaching for an arrow in the quiver on his back. That's when the dog, who had been happy and pleasant, bared his teeth and gave a menacing growl. Somehow the canine had guessed his intent and was preparing to attack. Daniel could already see the dog's muscles tense as he readied himself to spring. Not liking this situation, Daniel judged the distance between them, judging that it would be a difficult shot to hit. He would have little time to aim when the dog charged. Daniel had been trained to hit larger targets, not ones as small as a dog. Even werewolves rarely chose the form of a regular wolf, even as large as this one. They preferred to be much bigger and stronger, using their size and strength to their fullest advantage. Daniel generally never let them get this close because he had learned how to spot them ahead of time. His chances at actually hitting this animal were not good and the wolf was just strong enough to wound him heavily, if not kill him. Daniel had been standing there for a few moments, frozen in a stalemate, trying to think of a way out that wasn't going to end up bad. Hearing a noise from inside, he decided to gamble and release his hold on the arrow and put away the bow. There you are, Max, a woman said as she came to the door. As if she just noticed him, the woman said, 
Oh, hello there. Can I help you, mister? Are you lost or something? Daring to take his eyes off the still-crouched dog, Daniel turned his attention to the speaker. Before him stood one of the most beautiful women he had ever seen in his life. She wore a simple crimson robe and nightgown made out of silk that had a similar color that did not hide her curves. The nightgown stopped at mid-thigh, which could easily draw his attention and hold it. Her robe, hastily tied now, fell open, revealing her smooth legs. For a moment, Daniel was unable to speak and just stared at her. Seeing where his eyes were looking, she immediately closed her robe, tying the sash while blushing. Regaining her composure, the woman said, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Leah. What's your name? Daniel couldn't believe it. This beautiful creature was the one he was supposed to kill? Seeing him stare at her blankly, Leah concerned, asked, Are you all right? Shaking himself out of his stupor, Daniel sputtered out, Me? I'm fine. My name is Daniel. His eyes were still glued to her, and he had trouble breathing. The moonlight caught her flesh in its soft light, giving it an exquisite glow that was awe-inspiring. Daniel was so enamored in her lovely image that he felt a burning in his lungs and a weakness in his body. Turning his attention away, he noticed he had forgotten to breathe. Choking as he tried to force air back into his lungs, he saw this sweet woman come toward him. Here, sit here, Leah said, offering the cement step leading up to the house. I'm fine, I can walk, Daniel said, as he attempted to do just that. Feeling a dizzy, he stumbled and fell. Daniel could not account for this strange reaction, but he liked what he heard next. Him falling flat on his butt elicited a girlish giggle that surprised both of them. To Daniel, it sounded like music. Anthony did not like what he was seeing. This man had come to kill Leah. Only her looks and Anthony himself kept him from trying to do it. Growling, he showed his displeasure. Leah seemed to be unaware of the danger, treating her would-be killer like some strange suitor. Better to kill the man now and be done with it, as far as Anthony was concerned. Taking the growling to just mean that Max was refusing to welcome this handsome visitor because he was a stranger, Leah Calm down, Max. He seems harmless. Anthony was not ready to forget Daniel's true purpose here, but he wasn't ready to upset Leah either. Daniel was still hesitating, unsure of what to do now. Anthony looked at Leah and could see why. In his original shape, Anthony would also probably found her alluring as well. His current form, however, gave him the distance to think more objectively. Now he was not thinking of his own selfish interests, but hers. Now Anthony hoped that Daniel would continue to fall for her, so he would no longer thinking of harming her. Deciding to act like a bad dog, Anthony rushed forward as Daniel tried to get up charging between his legs. The impact of Anthony's passing knocked Daniel off his feet, sending him down hard on his back. Concerned, Leah rushed forward, helping him up. Grasping her arms for leverage, Daniel felt her heart beat. It was strong in power. Already he could feel it quicken with excitement. When Daniel was standing firmly again, Leah quickly withdrew, affected greatly by their closeness. Leah's eyes were downcast as she tried to slow her breathing. And strong, beating heart. A sweet perfume wafted to Daniel's nose that made her even more desirable to him. Unable to control himself, he rushed forward to kiss her. At first, he expected her to show her true strength and push him away. Instead, he found her to be gentle, acting like a human woman, soft and delicate. Part of Daniel wanted to reveal his fullness so she could reveal hers. No longer did he think of her as a blood drinker, but as a gorgeous woman whose lips were so inviting and her body so warm and equally inviting pressed against his. Daniel returned that night with her number unsure of how to proceed. He could no longer kill her and reporting the situation to his superiors was definitely out of the question. Daniel was simply too close to her now, and what was more he knew she was not evil. He had always been able to tell even in early childhood when someone was good or bad. It was a feeling he got deep inside. With the good ones, he felt comfortable and safe like a warm blanket was being wrapped around you. With the bad ones, you felt a chill run up your spine. 
He had begun to feeling that warm feeling when he first saw her, that same comfortable feeling that meant that the council had made another mistake. Still, Daniel was glad for it. Otherwise, he would not have met her. On his way back to his apartment, picking up a duffel bag he had hidden behind a dumpster, he stuffed his equipment into so it would remain hidden. Heading up the steps, his thoughts drifted back to Leah. He quickly hid the smile that had begun to form on his face as an all-too-familiar figure showed itself in the doorway of his apartment building. Did your mission go well? Donovan asked. Yes, sir. It is taken care of. Daniel lied. If they sent another team, they might harm Leah, and he couldn't allow that. Better they not know what really happened, and she might possibly be forgotten. Good we are now able to focus on more pressing matters. It seems another one is present here, Donovan said, handing him a note. Here is the address. See that it is done. Of course, sir, Daniel said, taking the note from him and reading it. As Donovan left, Daniel couldn't wondering why Leah had not reacted to this other one as it had been with all the other new blood drinkers. Something strange was happening and he didn't like it. The directions took him to a group of apartments toward Dowtown. Making his way to the rooftops, he tried to climb in through one of the windows. As he began to enter, a hand suddenly grasped him, jerking him inside. Tumbling into the far wall, Daniel tried to get up and see who it was. Looking where he had sat perched at the window, he saw nothing. Hearing breathing to his right, he swung with a backhanded at the target in his peripheral vision. As his hand reached the place where his target should be, he hit nothing but air. Before he could recover, a blow blindsided him, sending him flying. He hit another wall face first. Shaking away the cobwebs, he tried to gain his feet as he turned around. Now that same hand shot forward, clamping down on his throat and lifting him off the ground. Though he tried with all his might, Daniel could not free himself. Focusing on the person in front of him, he noticed it was a woman. Unlike Leah, this was not trying to be gentle. Her grip was like a vice clamping down each time he struggled tighter and tighter. Like Leah, she too was attractive, but in a different sense. This one was more dark and brooding. She had not said a word yet, though her eyes and face told Daniel everything he needed to know at the moment. This strange woman was prepared to kill him if he gave her a good enough reason. Judging by your methods and weaponry, you came to kill me. Too bad for you, I'm not easy prey. Consider yourself lucky that you had not met my husband first. Lenny would have shot you no questions asked for breaking into our home, the woman said. I'm sure he would if he had not been called away. It happens to cops from time to time. Another voice said, Let me handle him, Samantha, we have already met. Stepping into the moonlight behind her that was coming in through the window, the second person revealed himself. The man was well built and held a certain resemblance with the woman. How do we know each other? I don't remember your face, Daniel said. Smiling, the man said, My name is Anthony. The woman holding you is my daughter, Samantha. You might recognize me by another name, Max, perhaps. Yes, we have met before, Daniel. But Max is Leah's dog, Daniel said, not believing him. He barely caught the expression that crossed over Samantha's face. This woman recognized Leah's name. I have gained the ability recently to take on other shapes, a side effect of my condition, I am afraid. Now that we have been properly introduced, you may let him down, Samantha. Shooting him a questioning glance, Samantha wondered what he was doing. Without even taking his eyes of Daniel, Anthony said, Don't worry, I'll kill him if he doesn't behave. You do understand these conditions, don't you, Daniel? You behave, you live. You don't, and I'll make you a corpse. Simple but effective, wouldn't you say? Nodding, Daniel wondered how he was going to get out of this. Setting him down roughly, Samantha backed away out of arm's reach. Stepping forward, Anthony said, I have heard of you. You are the hunter. You and your fellow huntsmen kill vampire and werewolves. More recently, you have killed, what is it you call us? Ah, yes, the new blood drinkers. I met one of your huntsmen once. Sadly, he did not listen to my warning. I hope you are not as foolish. I made a note to learn more about you people from then on. Would it surprise you I have studied you as well? 
You are efficient, normally, I'll give you that. In this situation, you are simply outclassed. I have heard some of this before, and I killed all the others like you that I've come across, Daniel replied, showing courage in the face of possible death. I am certain you have not. There is no one like the two of us in the world. Even we are different. I am the first to be born this way, and she is the second. I am the father of your so-called new blood drinkers. It was from me that they all sprung forth. I taught them how to hunt vampire and sent them on their way. I never realized what they would eventually become, Anthony said. What is wrong with them? Daniel asked. Simply put, they are like the very creatures I made them to hunt and destroy. They prey off of vampire like vampire prey off of humans. My creations never kill more than what can easily be replaced. So as to not diminish their food supply, Anthony said. Now it all made sense. That is why the vampire feared them so much. For the first time in their history, another creature was hunting not simply for survival, but for the pleasure of the kill. Now the vampires were facing a hunter just like them, unmerciful and just as bloodthirsty. Why did they change? Daniel asked. What makes you think they did? Unlike me, they were not designed to eradicate the vampire race. I was made to wipe them out. It was the reason for my existence. Later my creator changed his mind and out of guilt, and a growing love for me he raised me as his son. Still my goal has not changed since I became aware of my true purpose. For years I have sought to wipe out the vampire race only to fail because those I trusted to help me refused or died trying. I am genetically programmed to hunt vampire as is my daughter to a lesser extent. She knows what to do if pressed, but can easily refuse. I, on the other hand, crave it at times. I thought a recent confrontation with a werewolf would be enough to change things. When it bit me, I did not die as a vampire would have. Instead, I grew stronger than I believed possible. For a time, I believed my condition had stabilized. Condition? Daniel asked, fascinated by what he was hearing. Never had he ever encountered a being like Anthony. As the man spoke, Daniel could sense his exhaustion with life. By all accounts, Anthony should look young and vibrant. He had no age lines, now gray hairs to speak of, yet he seemed old as if he carried a great weight on his back. In comparison, Daniel's own sorrow seemed minuscule compared to this man. I appear to absorb whatever improvements I can from any transfer of blood. In the case of the vampire, I was given the purest strain making me physically superior to all of them. While I grow gradually changing over time, any new or improved DNA strain causes my body to jump to a new stage of development. When I encountered the lycanthrope, I drank its blood and accepted its powers. This was not my intention when I was fighting for my life, but still it happened. Now other changes are happening. I feel different somehow. I hear whispers somewhere in the back of my mind. Right now I hear one that is louder than the others. Anthony said, trying to focus on the voice. Looking closer at Daniel, he saw that the young man had turned his eyes and appeared to be thinking of something. While he wondered what Daniel was thinking about, Anthony heard him say, I wondered if Leah is like the others. If they are like the vampires by nature, could she be evil? The answer to your question is yes and no. Physically, Leah is like them, but she was turned differently. Because of this, she still acts like she is human, Anthony said. I didn't say anything. Daniel said, a bewildered look on his face. Yes, you did. I just heard you ask about her, Anthony said. When Daniel shook his head, indicating he hadn't done that, Anthony was confused. When he realized what had happened, Anthony was unsettled, walking spast Daniel. He looked out the window, appearing to be deeply troubled by this realization. What is it? Daniel asked. Samantha, who had stood back listening to the conversation, chimed in, saying, He heard your voice, but you said the question in your mind, not through your mouth. I still don't understand. If anything, that sounds amazing. Why would he seem upset about that? Daniel asked. Every change my father has experienced in the past has indicated a new transformation. 
as he said, he had hoped it had ended. Now he is facing the possibility of changing into something worse, Samantha replied. Why don't you change? Daniel asked, trying to grasp the significance of this discovery. I was born this way naturally, not made as my father was, and my mother was human. Come with me, please, Samantha said. Following her, she showed him a cradle with a baby boy inside. This is my child, Tony. He is the offspring of my husband and I. My husband is also human, just like my mother was. We can never fully be like my father. My changes are much more gradual than my father's. I did not experience the first ones until around my 18th birthday. Now I am not quite as strong as he is, and I am a little faster. I imagine my son will be similar in most respects, Samantha said. When was your last change, Anthony asked. Couldn't you sense it? It was around the same time you were bitten, Samantha said. How do you know that? Daniel asked. My daughter and I share a connection. It was how I found her after years of separation. We each know each other's thought and what the other knows by searching their memory, at least usually. Now it seems she can still sense me, but I can't sense her at least not to that degree, Anthony said. Laying a comforting hand on her father's shoulder, Samantha said, You still can. Focus on my voice in your mind. Find it, and you will sense my thoughts. Anthony looked from his daughter to Daniel, then said, This should prove interesting for you, Hunter. You about to see if I can do just that. Closing his eyes, Anthony searched for his daughter's voice in his mind. Shifting through the myriad of other voices drifting through his consciousness, he found what he was looking for. Like a jolt, his mind was filled with her thoughts and emotions droning out everything else. Memories of times long past before they had found each other floated in. He saw a life filled with pain and loneliness as young Samantha tried to find her way in the world. Tears began to form and run down his cheeks. The emotions he felt were overwhelming. He could not separate himself from them. Like a door slamming shut, he was shut off. Taking a deep breath, Antony tried to figure out what happened as he was left kneeling on the ground, weak and trembling. Are you all right? When I sensed how far you were enveloped, I tried to close off our connection. It looks like I succeeded. Samantha said, helping him up his legs were shaky underneath him. Showing a tired smile to reassure her, Anthony said, It seems our connection is indeed still strong. If anything, time has strengthened it. I felt what you felt as a child. I am sorry for not being there. I should have been able to protect you and guide you through those hard times. You did not deserve them, just like you don't deserve this. Seeing her father like this warmed her heart. Samantha knew he normally kept such things to himself. He had spoken out loud his thoughts earlier more for her benefit than Daniel's. Wiping away his tears, Samantha said, It's all right, Dad. You didn't know I had survived when Mom died. Shaking his head emphatically, Anthony said, No, I should have been there. I could have helped you through it. Perhaps I could have offered you some comfort. Looking away, he felt the tears come again. He had never realized what his selfishness in those years had caused. Now that he was confronted with it, he felt wretched and worthless. Samantha was his only child and he had failed her as he had failed to protect his wife, her mother. Look at me, Samantha said with all the love in her heart. When he did, he saw her love for him as she held him with her eyes. There is nothing to forgive. You are here now. You came back to protect me from danger. As long as I have known you, Dad, you have never failed me. Not all children can say that about their fathers. The past is the past. Let it go, for it does not help you now to think of it. Your family needs you now. I need you. Your memories have shown me a war is coming. As much as you want to stay out of the way, you can't. Too many innocent people will be hurt. Perhaps even your grandson. The huntsman found us. Who is to say they will not try again? Samantha said. Listening to this, Daniel thought of his own parents. Taken from them at a young age, he had never really known them. He had needed to prepare for the life as the hunter, so he would be eventually able to fulfill his destiny. Now he found he too regretted the past. 
Daniel did not want his children to suffer as he had. It was time to choose a side. The council had been wrong about Samantha and Leah, and he was tired of killing for them. He would have to choose who he would place his faith in. Let it be these people, Daniel thought. Still, he wanted to know more about them, particularly Leah. Who tried to turn Leah into a vampire and why, Daniel asked. The former king of the vampire nation did. He did so to convince me to join him, Anthony said. Why, Daniel asked. Do you remember when I said my maker made me from the purest strain, Anthony asked. Nodding, Daniel said, yes, I do. Well, the purest line comes from the source, and that was the king, my biological father. Apparently, when I killed him, instead of wiping out the rest of them in one stroke, I took his place in the great vampiric web. Now their survival depends on me. He had trapped us in the mansion that had been set on fire. Amik had been waiting inside with Leah, lying on the floor unconscious behind him, when I tried to kill him the first time. Facing raging flames or a fall from a third-story window, I chose the fall. The problem was, Leah was already beginning to turn and she wouldn't survive the fall because she was still so weak, so I gave her my blood to drink in an effort to fortify her. After she drank and I was sure that she was stable enough, I jumped. I cushioned her using my own body the best I could and made sure she made it to hospital and left her there. I didn't know that she was different from the other blue drinker I made. Alexandra, after a fashion, couldn't stand to be near me without going out of her mind. I feared the same thing would happen to Leah, and I did not want to do that to her. In our bloodlust, we can become heartless to our perceived enemies. I can speak from experience, Anthony said. But why would he... Daniel began to ask, stopping himself as he figured it out. You loved each other. That is why he knew you would come. It made sense. In wolf form, he could protect her without raising any old issues. Daniel also realized the man still might have strong feelings for her. If you want, I could back off. Now that I know about your past, Daniel tried to say. Shaking his head, Anthony interrupted, saying, No, she chose you. Besides, that ship has sailed. I doubt she would accept me back even if I wanted to ignore the danger I might pose to her. In my wolf shape, no one recognizes me for what I truly am. I will continue to protect her as long as I can, but soon I will need help. When that time comes, she will be your charge. Can't she take care of herself? Daniel asked. Leah still thinks like a human. It makes her vulnerable. If I had not been there to stall you, then you would have killed her before you could really think about it, Anthony said. You're right. I am too accustomed to following orders. Daniel said, not happy that he probably would have done what Anthony said. We each have our problems, Daniel. You can choose to get past yours. It is a gift that God gave all humans, Anthony said. He gave you that choice too, Anthony, Daniel replied. Perhaps, but my options become more and more limited as time goes on. Soon I will barely have any left, Anthony said. Daniel couldn't imagine dealing with the idea that you knew that your life was only going to get worse as time went on. Personally, he would rather go out fighting. Perhaps that's what Anthony had planned, and who could blame him? Won't the huntsmen dislike him trying to protect Leah? Samantha asked. They will like it even less when they find out he lied to them, Anthony said, studying Daniel. He saw a look of shock cross over Daniel's face as he said it. No, I did not get that from your mind. It is obvious. You hesitated because you came to like her. It is easy, I know. Leah is a beautiful woman and has a kind heart. If you told them what happened, they would question your loyalty and demand that you lead a team to kill her and me if necessary. You don't strike me as a man who would want that to happen. You are questioning the path you have taken and wonder if it was the wrong one. Believe me, I too have been through that, Anthony said. You'll be happy to know I have chosen a new one. I will help you as best as I can to avoid this war or help win it. Whatever it comes to you, have my support, Daniel said. Glad to hear it. We need all the help we can get. You should head back tonight. 
the huntsman may be watching your apartment, Anthony said. One of them is here. Donovan is a member of our council, Daniel said. I know I saw him. I followed you when you left Leah's house. I wanted to make sure you would pose no further danger to her. I couldn't hear what you were saying. I was much too far away, but I could see Donovan leave after he stopped you in front of your apartment. Anthony said, What happens now? Daniel asked, Tomorrow I will take you to see Santiago. He has helped us in the past. He will be happy to know that I will be helping to try to avoid bloodshed, Anthony said. A group of men dressed in street clothes entered the city. The winter cold did not seem to affect their pale skin. As they headed underneath an overpass, two individuals separated themselves from the shadows. Upwind of them, the vampire had never even smelled them coming. When the wind finally shifted, the vampire froze in fear. None had seen two of these new ones in one place before. If one had come alone, they might have been able to take it, but two was another matter. Choosing flight as the best option they ran for their lives. The new blood drinkers quickly caught up killing the stranglers and those who finally turned to resist. They drank their fill before entering the city, ready to search for more. Already they could sense the presence of the first. Antony was already inside. Why, they had no idea. Santiago looked over the report of the cleanup. The carnage at the edge of the city was messy and difficult to hide. Some of the vampire had been torn to pieces. His people still didn't know who had done this. Sitting at his desk inside his office, he looked over the pictures. There was a knock at the door and Paul entered. Anthony is here and he brought someone with him, Paul said. Nodding, Santiago waved them in. To what do I owe the pleasure, my friend, Santiago said upon seeing Anthony enter. Still wearing the old garb, I see. You have not changed much either. How are things, Anthony said. Troublesome, who is your companion, Santiago replied. Motioning Daniel forward, Anthony said, This is Daniel, you know him as the hunter. Santiago raised his eyebrows in surprise. Interesting. I assume he is an ally in our cause, Santiago said. Nodding, Anthony said, He is indeed. What is the source of this trouble you mentioned? Someone killed a sizable group of vampire just inside the city limits. This would not be your work by chance? Santiago said, spreading the pictures out for them to see. Glancing at them, Anthony shook his head, saying, No, it is the work of two new blood drinkers. I sensed their presence as surely they sensed mine. They entered the city last night. Sighing while leaning back in the chair, Santiago said, This does not bold well. More will surely come. They are all converging here and soon the werewolves will come. Or at least that's what my sources say. You might want to get better sources. At least one of them is here. I had a run-in with her. Her name is Katrina, Anthony said. Did you say Katrina? Santiago said, obviously alarmed. What is the problem? Daniel asked, wanting to get involved in the conversation. Katrina is their queen. She has ruled them alone, taking only the occasional mate for a time. If she is here, so are the others. It appears my sources have become quite poor over the years. I did not think so many possible threats would have slipped into the city without my notice. I was aware a werewolf was here. I received reports that you, Anthony, were attacked not long ago, Santiago said. And so I was, Anthony said with a nod. Since our enemies are converging here, what resources do you have, Anthony asked. I have very little. After I helped you, the council denounced me. My former supporters among the great houses do not dare back me for fear of making enemies with the council itself. My only remaining supporter is Queen Nimaya. She alone has kept the council from taking revenge upon me. With her help, I still have allies in the lesser houses, but they can only help me so much. What we need is a central leader to unite us. Right now we are divided between the queen and the council. I am sorry to say it, my friend, but it would have been better if you had not killed Amek. Even in a weakened state, he could have led us to victory. Now the vampire nation will fall and the victors will continue fighting, hoping to finish off the survivors. 
We will seek peace first, but if that is not possible, I will lead the vampires and the new blood drinkers I made, Anthony said. But what makes you think the new ones will follow you? Daniel asked. Because they seek his leadership as well. As much as they disagree with his motives, his creations know he is their best chance at survival. Santiago said, Why do you do this, Anthony? You could take those you care for and leave the city. Once away, you would be safe. When everyone arrives, your enemies will kill each other. Not all are my enemies. Besides, my time grows short. You know of what I speak? Anthony said, looking at Santiago. Nodding, Santiago replied, Yes, I have seen the recent blood work. Paul says your time is running out before the next transformation. It could happen any day now for all we know. So you plan to stand with us. These could possibly be your last happy days, Anthony. Are you sure you would not wish to enjoy them with your family and safety? With a grim look on his face, Anthony answered, What is safe anymore, Santiago? Last night the huntsman sent Daniel to kill my daughter. When does it end? As long each group seeks open war with the others, this will continue to happen. It has to end here. If this is to be the end of me as I know it, then this is my last chance to make a difference. I have been selfish for too long with my war against the vampire. Now I must place my family first and those who stood by me in hard times. With a grim chuckle, Antony said, Strange is it not? When we first met, we tried to kill each other. You nearly succeeded in doing just that, but instead, in doing so, you made my life better. I realized who I truly was and by chance managed to find my long-lost daughter. Now you are my most loyal friend. God has a funny sense of humor, doesn't he? Laughing as well, Santiago said, Yes, he does. The idea that two mortal enemies could become best friends sounds like something he would like to think up. There are so many things I have regretted in my past, so many things I have wanted to change. Now, like you, my time is running out. If peace fails, I will die along with my people. I cannot speak for the rest, but as for me, I for one am glad to have you with us, Santiago said, clapping Anthony on the shoulder. The two of them tried to discuss things a little more and parted on good terms, wishing the other one luck. Anthony and Daniel left together, walking along the sidewalk. I have learned much since we last spoke, Anthony said to Daniel. What in particular have you learned? Daniel asked. Looking at him as they continued to walk, Anthony said, who we are in the great web. This caused Daniel to stop because he did not understand. His mind thought it over, trying to figure out what Anthony meant. Offering his hand palm turned upward, Anthony said, take my hand, Daniel, and I will show everything you have ever wanted to know and more. Looking at Anthony's hand, Daniel decided to trust him. Reaching out, he gripped it firmly. A shock went through his body, disorientating him, and without realizing it, his eyes closed. When he opened them again, there was three groups of lights in front him. Each group was a different color and all were surrounded by a black darkness that surrounded them. To Daniel, the lights shone like bright groups of stars or constellations. What are these lights? Daniel asked, looking at them marveling at how many there were. These are your enemies, Daniel. Each group belongs to a different species. That one, Anthony said, pointing at the group in the middle, colored in red, belongs to the vampires, your distant kindred. Looking at the red group, he noticed they were the most numerous of the three. What makes you think that? Daniel asked. Anthony pointed at faded red branch of the web of red lights and said, that is your line. Originally, your ancestors were vampire. The huntsmen found you and turned you back, at least to a certain extent. They purposely left you and all those before with a few of your former abilities. You are physically and mentally able to take on most vampires one-on-one. -on -one. You can also hunt werewolves as well as the blood drinkers I made. Turning to face, Daniel Anthony said, It all there, Daniel, your family's entire history. You are the last of your line and this is on purpose. Should your side win, you will be exterminated with the rest. As long as you live like me, you have the potential of easily making more. Daniel could now feel his connection to the Red Web. 
It was so strong he could not deny it. Part of him was like those he hunted. It made sense in a disturbing sort of way. Who better to hunt vampires than those who were linked to them, who shared some of their abilities? Daniel had never admitted it to anyone, but he had felt a bloodlust rise in him many times while he had been hunting. When he killed Vampire, it felt so natural, so right somehow. Even his dreams showed Daniel for what he truly was. His last one had shown him in his childhood home, a warm and familiar house it was suddenly broken into. Running to his room, he locked the door behind him. As the vampires tried to break down the door, Daniel managed to open the window leading outside and crawl out. As he feared they would come after him, he felt the change. He became a blood drinker that hunted their kind. Rushing into his home, he came at them. Now seeing what he had changed into, they fled before him, but it was too late he drank until they had no blood left, blood dripping from his fangs. Daniel roared with triumph, confident in his superiority. That vision now captured his mind. Now holding him in place, taking him back to that experience, like he had really lived it. But just as suddenly as it had come, it was gone. This is your future, Daniel, or at least what you will become if given the opportunity. It was not by chance that we met. I have seen your family's history unfold with my own eyes. I know what you are capable of. It calls to you the bloodlust, doesn't it? Anthony said, looking into his eyes with great intensity. Without knowing why he said it, Daniel told him, Yes, it calls to me. I can no longer deny what I am. I'm like the vampire. I want to drink blood just like them. Shaking his head, Anthony said, You are so much more. You are a natural hybrid like Samantha, just to a lesser extent. I can make you powerful, Daniel. More powerful than you ever thought you could be. But there is a price. Like me, you will be connected to the Great Web. But unlike Samantha, you will change if you drink from any of the other species. Samantha is immune to any such thing. She cannot be harmed or changed from drinking from one of the other two groups. Pointing to the blue-colored group, Anthony said, This group are the werewolves. When I drank from Katrina, who was the purest source, I shared her connection to them. I also hold a connection to the other group. Anthony pointed to the group colored in crimson. Those are the blood drinkers I was made to kill the vampire. I hold power over each group now. I can affect them or pass on my abilities to any one of them. I suppose it would be the same with someone outside of the web. I know this without truly understanding. Call it instinct. I know I can change. And I offer you the choice. I will become like you, Daniel said. A lesser me to be certain. I was made to grow quickly. Only then could I prove to be a great threat to vampire. My father never truly intended for me to breed as they do. I don't think he even considered the idea. You will be greater than most, second only to me or Samantha. But the point is you will be stronger than the rest I will make. Like Alexandra, a female vampire, who was my first for the new blood drinkers of the other group, you will be my new creations and improvement on the first batch, Anthony replied. What makes you think I will be different than the others you made? Daniel asked. Because I am different. It is difficult to explain. Now I can change someone more selectively. There is something else. You will be different in more than just your abilities. Your personality might change. In fact, I expect it, Anthony said. Why would you do this? Why me? Daniel asked. Because I trust you, Daniel, and I will need you in the fight that is coming. You will be no use to me or my family if you're dead. In the form I am offering you, I am sure you will survive, Anthony said. Will it hurt? Daniel asked. Nodding, Anthony replied, I imagine it will hurt very much, but in the end your body and mind will be remade. Preparing himself as best as he could mentally, Daniel took a deep breath, waiting for it to begin. Reaching out, Anthony touched him. Daniel's face suddenly contorted in a voiceless moan. The pain took the sound from his very mouth. His skin and muscles felt like they were on fire. Never in his life had he felt such pain. When he had thought it had lessened and he seemed to begin to recover another wave hit him worse than the first. Tears of blood trickled down his cheeks as he crumbled to the ground under the strain. A quivering mess of flesh and bone. 
A stabbing pain lancing through his consciousness caused him to pass out. When he awoke again, his body was stiff and cramped. Looking around at his surroundings, he did not recognize them. Where are we? Daniel asked. We are not far from where we were, merely a few blocks away in an alley. Look around and see if you notice something different, Anthony said. Curious at what he meant by that comment, Daniel did just that. His eyes searched the alley that seemed unusually bright. Daniel looked for a streetlight, but found none. My vision has changed. I see everything much clearer now. Daniel said, excited at this discovery. Wandering out of the alley, he wanted to see more. Are you ready for the rest of it? Anthony asked. When Daniel nodded, Anthony said, focus on the image of a werewolf. Think of one of them you have faced. Now, imagine yourself changing as they do. Focusing Daniel fixed the image in his mind, willing the change. He was surprised to note when it actually happened. Muscles in his body contorted and contracted, shifting to find the chosen form. There was pain and discomfort, but far less than his first change. When it was done, Daniel stood on all fours in the form of a werewolf. Pleased with Daniel's progress, Anthony said, Now adapt it. Changing into his werewolf form, which was more bipedal, he motioned for Daniel to imitate it. It took some effort, but Daniel managed it. Anthony was slightly bigger than him, but Daniel was still very intimidating in this form. Changing back, Anthony said, Excellent, you are doing quite well. Changing back, Daniel replied, It is difficult at first imagining the details, but after that, everything else seems to work on its own. Can I choose any form or just these forms? You can copy any form you wish with practice. Keep in mind that is only a mask. You still move as fast and as strong as before, with the exception of your werewolf form. You must be careful when trying to emulate someone or something. You can only change into living beings. Whether they really exist or not depends on your imagination, but remember the bigger you try to get the more pain you will feel. Your skin and bones must stretch to accommodate their new shape. Going beyond those limits causes possible permanent damage, so we don't try for something too big. Anthony answered, What is different about the werewolf form? Daniel asked. Werewolves are you unique on how they are built. In their shape, your abilities will adjust to fit their form. If anything, it will increase a number of your strengths. Keep in mind, of course, that you are now more noticeable. While we can easily blend in and hide our abilities, a werewolf cannot. Their abilities are more apparent in their body shape. It gives the viewer at least a general idea of who they are facing. Anthony answered. What other powers do we have? Daniel asked. First, let's head somewhere else. Here there is too much of a risk of being seen. Follow me and let your body go. Don't try to guide every movement, just the goal, Anthony said. In a burst of speed, Anthony headed off down the street, and Daniel hurried to follow. Letting go as he had been instructed, he watched as his body propelled him forward, bringing him into a comfortable distance behind Anthony. His surroundings blurred around him as moved at incredible speeds, dodging possible dangers with amazing reflexes. Daniel never knew something as simple as running could be so thrilling as he ran. Daniel found himself laughing with the pure joy of it. When at last they stopped, everything came back into focus as they slowed. Looking around at the woods that surrounded them, Anthony said, This will do quite nicely. Here we will have our privacy. Daniel was looking around as he studied the woods when he felt the sudden urge to move to his right. Sidestepping, he saw a punch sail past his head right where he had just been standing. Alarmed, he turned to block another punch, but it was too late, and it caught him in the gut, lifting him off the ground. Angry and in pain, he launched an attack of his own. Swinging for Anthony's head, he saw Anthony disappear at the last second. As the punch went through its full swing, it connected with the trunk of a tree Anthony had been standing in front of. Smashing a chunk of the bark off, Danielle noted the impact but felt no pain. Letting the momentum carrying him around, Daniel aimed for right behind him. Turning, he delivered the punch as Anthony stood right where he had guessed. 
Reaching out, Anthony grasped Daniel's forearm and tossed him into the air. Sending himself into a somersault, Daniel flipped forward so he landed safely on his feet. Snarling in rage and frustration, he attacked again this time, launching a hail of punch. Anthony blocked them, counter-punching, forcing Daniel to do the same. Their hands and arms became a blur as each tried to find an angle to attack each through or around the other person's guard. It was Anthony who finally succeeded rearing back and landing a massive punch. Using both his arms, Daniel absorbed most of the damage and was sent skidding back a few feet. Assuming a fighting stance, he prepared to attack once more. Hold on a minute, Daniel. I believe you have seen firsthand what you are capable of, Anthony said with a smile. Daniel was shocked. When he had tried to fight Samantha, she had beaten him easily. Now he had stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Anthony and made him step up his game. I never realized, Daniel said, still mentally dazed. Laughing at Daniel's reaction, Anthony said, Of course not. Most humans act like this when they experience such things. Leah was surprised when I first met her. To her, my powers were amazing while we learned to take them for granted. This is your true speed. This is how you should move, but your life as a human has taught you not to do. This is good for, if you acted this way, you would stand out. Remember the best place to hide is in plain sight. Your enemies will not expect it. But to do such a thing, you must do things that will make you uncomfortable. It is annoying not to show your real strength or speed. I know this from experience, but you must control such urges. It does you no good to look like the sheep in disguise, but act like the wolf. Act like this, and you will be picked out easily. That thought was indeed not pleasing to Daniel. Human strength and speed, if that of his former self with all its improvements, seemed diminished somehow in comparison. It seems so difficult. I don't like the idea of it, Daniel said. Sighing, Anthony laid a comforting hand on Daniel's shoulder, saying, it is the price we must pay. In the crowd, there is safety. As strong as we are, there are many who would fear and hunt us. In time, you will grow stronger and not fear this, but you must still continue to hide yourself until the right time. The young ones who come after you will not have your strength, and they will be in danger. Because you are the first, you must look after the others when I am gone. But where will you go? Why must I be given this responsibility? Daniel asked. He did not like the idea of Anthony leaving him. The older man was his teacher and had given these gifts. Daniel wanted to understand more and he knew Anthony had the answers he sought. Besides, he liked Anthony and would miss him if he was gone. Anthony was the closest thing to a father figure that Daniel had ever had. You gave me a new life and a way to protect the one I come to care for. Through you, I have found a purpose I have never felt before. What will I do when you are gone? Daniel asked despair in his voice. That purpose does not die with me. Many more will need your protection in the future. I have made you strong so you can protect those I love as well. Now take courage that time has not come yet. Anthony replied. Daniel went to his apartment while Anthony returned to Leah's home. Making sure she had not had any more visitors, he watched her house from the shadows a short distance down the street. As he sat there, he felt the blood burn again, preparing himself. This time, he welcomed it. His senses increased as the full impact of it hit him. Muscles and bone contracted and hardened, but this time there was no pain. The delirium his mind was now under took the pain away. When it was over, he growled with exhilaration at the power he felt. The natural high was sweet and soothing, allowing his body to calm itself. His ears focused on a sound approaching from behind. Someone was purposely trying to be silent. Anthony smiled when he noticed the pattern in the person's walk. A simple mental search confirmed his suspicions. Hello, Katrina. What might you be doing here? Anthony asked as he turned to view the surprised woman. I approached from downwind. How did you know I was coming? Katrina asked. Chuckling as he walked up to her, Anthony said, You werewolves are too dependent on your sense of smell. There are other senses that can also suffice. Impressed, Katrina said, It seems I can never sneak up on you. 
A pity I would like to surprise you that way for once. Well, you will just have to settle for other ways, Anthony said. An interesting scent wafted to his nostrils, catching his attention. His mind immediately recognized it belonged to Katrina, but it was different, somehow. Why has your scent changed? Anthony said. Reaching out, she gently held his hand and brought it to her belly. I have had a recent change, Katrina said. Anthony did not hear what she said. His mind had been touched by the life growing inside of her. Being this close, both minds were aware of each other. Anthony also noticed it was much larger than it should have been. The child was a boy, and Anthony could sense that the werewolf blood was dominant in him. Is it normal for a child among your people to grow so fast? Anthony asked, looking at her belly. Yes, it is. How did you know? I had not even told you I was pregnant yet, Katrina replied. Resting his hand on her abdomen as he looked at her, Anthony said, My daughter Samantha and I share a mental connection. When her mother died and I found Samantha years later, we learned of that connection. It strengthened with time and us remaining close. Our son and I share that connection. Already his tiny mind knows me and reaches out to me. Smiling at the look of joy that crossed Anthony's face at that moment, Katrina said, So now you have a second child. How does it feel? Removing his hand, he leaned forward and kissed Katrina before replying, I like the feeling. Taking his hands in hers, Katrina said, We both have suffered much. I too lost my first mate. I thought Lucius and I would be together forever. We even had a son named Alexander. Both were taken from me by the vampire. I held the broken body of my son in my arms. I will not stop until the last of them are dead. There was great pain in her voice and open anger. It was a feeling Anthony knew well. I lost my father, my wife, and my daughter. When the vampire set fire to our home, I spent years thinking all of them were dead. I have lost most of the years of my daughter's life, and I will never get them back. I never got to hold her as a baby. I never was there to chase away her nightmares or comfort her when she cried from some small hurt. I too wanted revenge against the vampire. Now I know that it will not fill the emptiness inside me. This, Anthony said again, laying a hand on her belly. This will. Only family matters, Katrina. A parent must think to their child's future. Would you doom our son to a war we might lose? The vampire are weak and their king lies dead, and their nation lies divided. Half our work has been done for us. Why not take advantage of the opportunity? Who knows how long it will last? Katrina responded. Removing his hand again, Anthony replied, You have other enemies that are coming here. Not all the vampires are responsible for your loved one's deaths, and most will not go down without a fight. This is open war, Katrina, and your other enemies will attack while your attention is directed elsewhere. If you speak of the huntsmen, you waste your time. With the vampire gone, we will slaughter them, Katrina said. Do not underestimate them. Besides, they are not the only ones who would be left. There are the new blood drinkers. For the first time, they will gather in one place. When they do, they will be driven insane and kill all your enemy and neutral alike until their thirst is satisfied. I know this for certain, Anthony said. If you know this, you know the one who made them? Who is he? Katrina asked. Turning away from Katrina hid his face from her. It is the same one who killed Amic, the late king of the vampire, and has now taken his place. I am the one I speak, Anthony said. Turning back around, he bared his blood teeth in a feral smile. I have learned much in these past few days. You fear nothing, so you will attack a wounded enemy before it can regather its strength. So I offer another choice. Accept a proposal of peace or face me, Antony said. With one gesture, Katrina was suddenly lifted off the ground and was made prone and immobile. This will better serve to illustrate my point, face me, and you will lose. Anthony said, moving closer. But make your decision soon, Katrina. The change has already begun. Soon I will become the monster all will fear. And next time, if you do not join me, I will kill you. 
As he walked away, Katrina found herself settled back on the ground, and before he disappeared, Katrina heard Anthony say, If I must play the villain to end this war, so be it. Now, as she felt the chill of those words run up her spine, Katrina knew what it was to be afraid. She had made a poor choice. Anthony had offered her peace, which included a chance to raise their new child in safety, and she had chosen vengeance. He would protect his daughter and those he trusted. Katrina cursed her stupidity for forcing his hand. All she loved in the man would now be destroyed. Hurrying, she rushed to stop her people. Katrina had to hurry to stop this war and save the man she had come to care for. A plane landed at a private airfield. Twelve well-dressed figures stepped off the aircraft. These were the individuals who made up the Vampire Council. For the first time in their existence, they had come to L.A. to lead their war against those who threatened them. Waiting near the plane were guards standing at the ready, the head of the council. Catherine Olestra noticed a lone figure outside the gate. Two more joined him then, two more after them. Fifty guards that were waiting had noticed them as well. Armed with specialized firearms designed for silver bullets, they sent a small group to check it out, believing they might possibly be werewolves. The first figure leapt over the gate with ease, catching them by surprise. Charging toward them, he suddenly disappeared. Turning to look behind them, the ten men saw Anthony just stand there. That is when they were hit from behind. All of the guards had paid so much attention to this one individual, they had not bothered to pay attention to the others. Dressed in cloaks with hoods that hid their faces, these strangers attacked with tooth and nail, ripping the guards to pieces before half of them could even turn around. Anthony himself finished the rest that remained. Reaching out with his mind, he made a crushing motion, focusing on the remaining vampire. The male guards dropped to their knees, blood pouring from their eyes, mouths, and ears. None could lift a finger or do anything but die, groaning in horrible agony. Turning his attention to the rest, Anthony said, You would do well to bow before your king or suffer their fate. Nikolai Kostov, second only to Catherine herself in the council, said, How do we... Before he could finish his sentence, Nikolai gripped his chest, his face contorted in pain. I'm sorry, were you about to saying something? Where are my manners? Please continue, Anthony said. Try as he might. Nikolai was in too much pain to say anything as he crumbled to the ground. Looking at him, Anthony said, You no longer have anything to say. Fine, then, allow me to respond to your comment. My name is Anthony, and I am your sovereign ruler. I killed a mech. I share his bloodline, and because of these things, I took his place. Now you are connected to me. You live or die by my will. And if I die, you all die. With that said, you may rise. The crushing grip on his heart quickly released itself, and Nicoly scrambled behind Catherine as if to hide himself from further harm. Taking a moment to collect herself, Catherine said, What does your lordship require of his faithful subject? For starters, this feuding amongst yourselves must stop. You have enough problems now, rather than adding to them. I have spoken with Katrina, head of the werewolves, and have given her ultimatum. If she refuses to accept peace, I will deal with her myself. You are not to get involved. Thirdly, you will work with Santiago's people, because all of you are at risk now. Your job is to prepare for the other two enemies, the Huntsman, and those I once created to hunt you, Anthony said. Bowing humbly, Catherine said, Your Lordship will have to forgive by impertinence, but aren't the ones here with you now among these new ones? They are of a different breed, an improvement over the old. You should know that if you fail to obey my instructions, they can each finish you off on their own without needing any help from me, Anthony said. Bowing again, Catherine said, Then we shall do as the king asks and await further instructions. Flashing his teeth and enjoying the reaction of fear it got as he saw Nicolai cringe in terror, he was impressed to note Catherine seemed to remain outwardly calm, hiding her fear. Despite himself, he liked her. Focusing his attention on her, Anthony said, It is good that we understand each other. 
I am certain that Santiago will greatly appreciate your assistance. Turning away, he left the hooded figures following his lead. When he was sure Anthony was gone, Nikolai said, What should we do? Looking at him as if he was stupid, Catherine said, Exactly as he purposed. We had enough trouble with Queen Namaya, and that was before the threat of open war. None of the other houses will dare stand against Anthony now that he is king and has accepted leadership of our kind. Like he said, we live or die by his will. Amek held the same threat over our heads when we displeased him. One fool tried to harm Amek, and he actually let him do it to prove a point. I spent years recovering from that idiot setting fire to Amek's crypt. I would have killed the fool myself if Amek had not done it first. Amek healed in less than a day, leaving the rest of us to suffer through the pain of our burns healing at a much slower pace. The council was created to make sure that we were united in whatever we did. Never again would one of us be allowed to threaten the lives of the rest. Now this new king says we must fight alongside Santiago, then that is what we must do. The choice is clear. Whether we like it or not, Nicolae, we are facing possible extinction. Save for the original creatures, Anthony made the rest seemed bent on our destruction if given a chance. Would you now seek to double-cross our would-be savior? How do you know he does not plan to kill us in the end? Nicolae asked. Because if he wanted to do so, Anthony could kill us now. With only a thought, that's how I know. He does not even need to be near us. He can choose to do it from any part of the world at his leisure, and he obviously knows that. Now quit your whining and help, or you might as well look for the nearest. Werewolf and ask him to just kill you now and be done with it. It would be a lot quicker than when they come looking for you, Catherine said. Taking this thought into consideration, Nicoly quickly rushed to keep up as they head to the waiting limousines. Catherine had always despised Nicoly, but he had his uses. One could always trust Nicoly to protect his own life, and he always managed to acquire the resources and support of the other council members to do just that. If it were not for that, the sniveling little weasel would have been killed long ago, probably by a little accident, like the one that happened to the former head of the council. Peleus had refused to step down, so Catherine had arranged to have him killed. Amic had been pleased by the method that she had used to handle the situation and was the only one who knew for certain that Catherine had ordered it. The others suspected she had played a part in his death, but none had managed to dig up any proof. Catherine had become very adept at covering her tracks. As a result, Amic sponsored her rise to power, making her second only to him and his queen. Catherine had learned to be calm under pressure. Loosing one's head did little to help solve the problem. Now she must lead by example and keep the great vampire houses in line. Strangely, for the first time, she trusted someone and did not mind working for this new king. Anthony seemed more trustworthy than Amic. The old king had gotten into the habit switching his support when he sensed weakens. What evidence they had managed to collect suggested that he was willing to fight to protect his family. It was for this reason the other council members had voted to set the trap of threatening his family to bring him to L.A. Catherine had refused to sign the order, hiding behind the excuse that it might earn his wrath if he found out who had given the order, and she did not wish to invite his wrath. The real reason was that Catherine had a small weakness. Family. It was a weakness her sire Peleus had made sure to remove because of the threat they represented. As long as they lived, they would warm Catherine's soul when Peleus believed she should be cold-hearted to survive. He had groomed her to be a fellow council member and follower. Unfortunately for him, Catherine had never forgotten the killing of her children and husband, all that she had left in those days. Now she was alone with nothing to fear. Peleus's death had brought little comfort to her hollow heart. Now, seeing a king that would fight for those of his line brought new life to her heart. She remembered what it was like to feel such a feeling, and now she closed her eyes, enjoying the moment. For the first time in centuries, Catherine felt tears run down her face. The tears of blood trickled down her face, leaving wet trails down her cheeks, ending at her chin before dripping to the ground. That night, when all was in order, she visited her new monarch, 
finding him on the rooftops of the city. It was not the largest of the apartment buildings, but it had a great view. Facing away from her as he gazed at the streets below, Anthony said, Why have you come, council member? Walking closer, Catherine said, I failed to introduce myself. My name is Catherine Olestra. I am the head, the council. Lowering head and eyes in difference towards him, Catherine continued saying, May I ask a question of your lordship? This question raised Anthony's curiosity. Ask your question, Catherine. Anthony said, I sense a shadow upon your soul. It has only appeared recently. May I ask the cause of this change? Catherine asked. Raising an eyebrow, Anthony said, What change are you referring to? Looking into Anthony's eyes, Catherine said, Since I was first bitten, I have had the ability to sense changes in others. It took time to develop it, and at first I was not sure what I was experiencing, but I have found it quite useful in the past. I sense such a shadow on your soul. You now stand deep in the shadows, gaining strength from them for the first time. Never before have you ventured so far into the darkness. The Queen has not been the only one watching you. It seems I have many women interested in me these days, Anthony said. Is it a thought that distresses you, Catherine said. Looking at her more closely, Anthony saw an attractive blonde woman with beautiful deep blue eyes. Leaning forward, he sniffed her neck, inhaling her scent. He smelled the pheromones that seemed so faint, yet showed her sexual attraction to him. Leaning back and taking in her flushed face, Anthony said, Actually, I find it alluring. My strength grows each day and night. I have now begun to take powers for my own that I could have never dreamed of before this moment. Would you like to taste it or perhaps share in it? Together we may become stronger and help to hold back our enemies. Anthony offered her his hand and Catherine took it freely. The dream he offered her spoke to her aching soul. With a touch of his hand, new strength flowed through her limbs and her body changed to become more like his. When at last the transformation was finished, Anthony showed Catherine her future, warning her of its dangers. In this new body you will be better prepared, but now you still must be cautious. Many perils still remain in your path, Anthony said. I understand, seer. Catherine replied, Do not refer to me in that term while we are in private. I find it unnecessary and unwanted. I require a confident Catherine. I need someone to speak my mind to and to be my companion in more ways than one. The other women in my life have a personal stake in this. You, on the other hand, have no family or personal hatred against the other sides in the coming war. In truth, Catherine, I too have watched you as well. I already knew your name before we met, but I must admit I only knew your history. You intelligent and calculating the perfect villain. It is that quality that I am interested in. Like me, you chose to remove obstacles when it suited us, and both involved issues with our families. You can teach me many things and provide me the support I need to accomplish the goal I seek to attain, the peaceful settlement of this conflict, Anthony said. Why do you seek peace, Anthony? You could eliminate your enemies easily, the vampires at the very least with a thought. We are your enemies after all, Catherine suggested. Grasping her shoulders, Anthony pulled her in close. You are not my enemy, Catherine. We are now more alike you and I. If you wish I can provide you with something no vampire could ever hope for, a human child. The shock registered clearly on Catherine's face as she said, how is that possible? His left hand straying to her belly, Anthony replied, whatever blood runs through veins, I have the power to recreate. A hope arose in Catherine's soul, describing a secret wish. Could you make me human again, like the child you would offer me? This greatly interested Anthony, and he became curious, and he said, I offer you power and immortality, and you ask to return to the life of a mortal. Looking away, believing he was denying her request, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have expected you to understand. Forgive my foolishness. Gently grasping her chin and lifting it so she looked up at him, Anthony replied, On the contrary, I understand that all too well. 
I myself have wished for such a thing many times, and I would be glad to offer it to you now that I have that I have the power to do so. I should warn you that this will not be easy for you. I imagine it has been some time since you birthed a child, having not lived as a human for many years. Blood is not an ideal nutrition, babies. Smiling, Catherine said, I think I remember what it was like. When was this supposed to happen? It was then that she noticed a mischievous smile appear on Anthony's face. Now? Catherine asked, surprised. I find the sight of you in this light to be quite lovely. Anthony said, You'll have to try a little harder than just to call me pretty to get me in the mood, Catherine said. Leaning forward, he kissed her passionately and deeply. Already she could feel the change occur and the power she had once had drain away only to be replaced by a sense of wholeness that she had not felt in a long time. Catherine knew without being told she was indeed human again. When he broke the kiss, Catherine was flushed and breathing heavy. Her lungs, unaccustomed to breathing, were now gulping in air. Calming herself, Catherine said, That's much better. The second kiss was followed by Anthony, lifting her up into his arms and carrying her off to secluded place where they would be less exposed. Anthony had found many abandoned buildings or ways to access building with nice rooms. He chose the latter of the two. Leaping from roof to roof, he made his way to a nearby apartment. Making the final leap, he crossed the flat roof with its many chimneys and saw the roof access into the building. Sometimes this door was locked, but most of the time it wasn't. There was little risk of someone sneaking in this way. The nearest building was too far away for a human to leap or cross the gap by normal means. That night the door was unlocked as he turned the knob after setting Catherine down. Opening the door, he waited for Catherine to enter first. They found an empty room where the door swung open at Anthony's command. Katrina arrived at her warehouse where the werewolves were supposed to meet. It was just after nightfall, and she was the last to arrive. She made her case to the others trying to turn them from the path of war. Taulus and a few others were prepared to join her, but the rest balked. Drake was unprepared to give up his quest for vengeance. The vampires had slain his mate and their child just as they had hers. Drake was the greatest of their fighters and held great influence. Time and time again, Katrina had counted on his strength to turn the tide in battle against their mortal enemies. Now they were at odds and he refused to back down. Only old feelings of obligation caused him to hesitate in taking her life and removing her as an obstacle to his revenge. It was then that the servants of Anthony struck. Turning off the lights in the warehouse, they attacked with silver arrows fired from bows and crossbows. Under this hail, the rebelling werewolves were forced to seek cover. Using the protective screen, others of his servants led Katrina and the loyal werewolves away. When it was all over, a few rebels lay dead and Queen Katrina had escaped. Hearing one of his servants approach, Anthony arose from his bed where Catherine still slept soundly. She's safe, Anthony whispered. The servant nodded in reply. Good. Keep her safe and get her out of the city. The same goes with Queen Namaya and Catherine. Take each to a different city. You may choose which, with the exception of Catherine. She shall be taken to San Diego. Catherine will remain safe enough there may sure to transport them separately and keep them out of sight from each other. I wish no one else to know of their movements. After they reach their destination, you will watch over them, Anthony said. And your daughter, the servant said. I will deal with her and my grandson myself. Keep to your duties. Bowing the servant left to give his master's orders to the others. Samantha was playing with her son, shaking a rattle for his enjoyment. She felt her father's sudden presence rather than hear him. Much has changed in such a short time. What has happened to my father that he would become a villain? Samantha said without looking at him. He found himself facing a dilemma. How does Hero do something only a villain can do? The answer is he can't. Heroes are limited by their good nature and high morals. A villain, on the other hand, has no such reservations. He can do what a hero cannot. 
That is why I have made this choice, and that is why, my dear daughter, I need you. Anthony replied, walking up to her. Turning and looking at him, Samantha said, So I can become a villain like you? Chuckling, Anthony said, On the contrary, Samantha, I need you to be yourself, the hero. Even when you began to change, you never allowed it to totally consume you. You, my daughter, are inherently good. It will be through your heroism that our family's future will eventually depend after I have finished my task. You now have three siblings waiting to be born. Nemia, queen of the Vampirus, carries one. The second is Katrina, who was queen of the werewolves. And last but not least, Catherine, head of the Vampire Council. Being the eldest of my children, your siblings will look to you for guidance. Two of them will rule the vampire and werewolf nations. You will rule my original blood drinkers. The new ones I have made, I alone may command. But do not worry, they will protect all my children, including you. Tucking her baby in, Samantha asked, And what of this third child? What shall be its place be in your vision of the future? He will be born human, but will carry the bloodlines of all. Vampire, werewolf, and hunter. He will not realize his potential on his own, but must be helped. In time, he will be taken from his mother upon his birth and raised a human. It is my wish that he remain unaware of his lineage until the proper time. When that time comes, you, Samantha, will be his teacher, Anthony said. You are making me head of this growing family. If this is the case, what shall happen to you? You have not spoken of your place in this great household that is to come? Samantha said, concern showing on her face. Reaching out, Anthony touched her cheek, saying, Your worrying about me is touching. I am not finished changing. For me, the changes are unstable and are happening too quickly. Eventually, my body and mind will become too powerful to contain. I must rest and exile myself from the world, or my thirst will consume the world, and none will exist that can stop me. Holding his daughter's head in his hand, Anthony said, with the passage of time, you will become strong, Samantha. Now I must place inside you all my knowledge and as much of my power your body can handle so you can achieve your task. Do you accept this charge? Nodding, Samantha said, I do, Father. I will do my best to protect our house. A flood of pain and images caused Samantha to be racked by spasms and finally pass out from exhaustion. Calling his son-in-law, Anthony said, Take your family and leave the city for a time. Samantha will tell you when it is safe to return. With that, he left to carry on his plans. The huntsman began to wonder what had happened to Daniel. He was their last remaining source of information in L.A. All other sources had been quietly silenced, and how it had happened remained a mystery. None of the elders gathering in the city were aware of this fact, their subordinates were trying to solve the problem before the rest of the elders arrived. Donovan was now being apprised of the situation that very night. He ordered patrols out into the city streets to find out what had happened to their scouts. One such scout found the body of one her fellow huntsman. Bending down to get a closer look at the body, she did not sense any danger. A rustling sound behind her caused her to turn. Turning, she came face to face with sharp caninas before they clamped down on her throat. Donovan was in his room when a knock came at the door. Walking to the door, he opened it and saw the face of one his female scouts. Her name was Emily Milrose. Come in, Emily. What did you find on your patrol? Donovan asked, heading back to his desk and sitting down. Following him, she said, The last scout was killed not far from here trying to return with news. I found his body in an alley. Coming closer, she reached out, running her fingernails across the back of his neck, drawing blood as they raked against his skin. What are you? Donovan began to say, touching the back of his bleeding neck when the shadow on the wall began to change. It shifted from the form of a small female to one of a mid-sized male. Shaking with fear, Donovan turned around. He felt the hand of death upon him. As he came face to face with the intruder, the other said, My name is Anthony, and I understand that you tried to kill my daughter. Backing up into the chair behind, Eyeswood with fright, Donovan said, 
How did you get in here? Donovan's voice was barely a whisper. It was actually quite easy. I am honestly disappointed. Even without my disguise, I could have waltzed in here with little trouble. The few guards you had waiting were obviously inexperienced. They did not ask me any questions or really challenge me. I was told that the huntsmen were very good. It appears without your precious hunter to do your bidding, you're just overconfident in your own safety. Gaining back his courage, Donovan said, you are the one they talk about. To the vampire, you're some sort of boogeyman. I had long wondered until now if you really were as powerful as they say. I guess they were not far off. If you have come to kill me, then get over with it. I have had enough of this boring talk. Chuckling, Anthony said, Good. At least one of you elders has some spirit. The others begged for their lives at the end. Through my servant's eyes, I saw their last moments. Now you are here alone. Without anyone to come to your rescue, you... Not that it would matter. Bracing himself, Donovan awaited the blow to fall. Anthony struck in a blink of an eye, his fingernails slicing open Donovan's throat. Blood spurting forth with each heartbeat, Donovan fell to the floor, his face contorted in pain. Grabbing the leg of the chair, Anthony broke it off so it would retain a sharp point. Ironic, isn't it, that you should die by the same way you used to kill so many of your enemies and every one of your innocent victims? Anthony said, glancing at Donovan. Striding over to Donovan in a pool of his own blood, Anthony looked down at him with a pitiless gaze. Pray to God, Huntsman, because you are about to meet him, Anthony said, driving the wooden stake into Donovan's heart. Donovan's hands gripped the stake in his killer's hand. His body jerked violently for a moment, and then it lay still after he had exhaled one last time. Anthony could see that there was no life left in his eyes, leaving the stake embedded. Anthony rose, leaving the hideout, but not before setting it aflame. The leadership of the huntsmen lay dead. Without them, the huntsmen would be in chouse. The scouts returned to find the devastation and were left with two questions. What had happened and what were they supposed to do next? Alexandra sought out her former master. Try as she might, Alexandra could not turn against Anthony. Her connection to him was strong, which made it easy for her to find him. When she did, he was walking the streets. Stopping, Anthony turned, sensing her presence. Why have you come? The others of your kind are still on the hunt. Should you not be joining them? Anthony asked. We have abandoned you, and yet you still take the time to keep track of us. Why is that? Alexandra asked. I sired many of you. Whether you like it or not, you are still a part of me, Anthony said. Shaking her head, Alexandra said, What have we done to deserve your patience? When I thought that I had waited in vain, you came to warn me of a danger to my family. Perhaps you are the reason, Anthony said. I have come to tell you that you needn't count me among your enemies. While I can't turn against the others, I can't turn against you either. I will stand aside and let destiny take its course. I would wish you well, my sire, and hope that you will not think ill of me for my weakness," Alexandra said. Farewell, Alexandra. Though you might not understand it now, please take no offense when I say that I hope we will never again meet in this world," Anthony replied. The two parted, each going their separate ways. Now it had come to it. Anthony readied himself to meet the final challenge. Through his servants, he sent word to each of the warring parties that they would meet far outside the city the following night. Once there, he would provide them with the opportunity to remove him, the last obstacle towards war from their path. Come if you dare. If you do not show yourselves, then you will only show all that you fear me. Anthony said in his message, he had no doubt that all involved would indeed come. Already the bloodlust inside struggled against its bonds. He had done his best to sate its thirst, but still his body and soul craved more. Drinking the blood of his victims had only served to lessen it for a time. His resolve was weakening with each passing night. It must be soon. I cannot hold myself back much longer. Soon, nothing will satisfy it. 
Anthony thought to himself. The sudden and familiar presence of another nearby alarmed him. What is she doing here? Anthony thought, looking in that direction. Already the thirst began to whisper to him seductively, Take it. She holds blood within. Just give us a little, and we will be satisfied. Deep inside, he knew it was a lie, but Leah's heartbeat called to him, and he yearned for it. Anthony had never realized that he had unconsciously counted on the connection on his daughter for strength. As his condition continued to deteriorate, he felt his will weaken and saw the darkness of his soul extinguish the light. Without realizing it, he gave in, sinking into a cold embrace. He was alone and lacked Samantha's strength as she lay unconscious. Heading towards Leah, Anthony moved silently so she would not know exactly where he was. When at last she sensed his approach, Leah turned and smiled. Hello, Anthony. I thought it was you. Unfortunately, this was not the Anthony she knew. The hunger had taken him, and all he knew was the beating of her heart and the life that flowed through her veins. His eyes caught hers, and she gave of herself willingly. When he tasted her blood, his teeth buried in her neck, their breathing quickened. Even as her life ended, she felt no hint of pain and gave in to the darkness. When it was done, he awoke from his stupor and saw what he had done. Tears fell from his eyes as held her limp form to him, knowing she would never know life again. There was a time that I would have given my life for yours, and now I have taken what I held so dear. Yours shall be among the last, I promise you, Anthony said. He buried her that night on the hills outside the city, not far from the meeting place. He stayed there sleeping upon the earth beside her, his mind dreaming of the life they could have shared if he had been born human and not as he was. That was how Daniel found them. When were you planning to tell me? Daniel said as Anthony awoke. Anthony gave no words of apology. He knew that such words would have done him no good. With a roar, Daniel attacked, swinging his sword. Anthony neatly dodged, raking his sword arm. Blood welling up in his wounds, Daniel switched the sword to the other arm. Neither man expected the other to give way. Both knew only one would leave this fight alive. Squaring off, they felt each other out, watching for an opening. Striking first, Daniel pulled a weapon Anthony did not expect. Daniel had exaggerated the condition of his wounded arm. He managed to pull out the weapon and surprise Anthony. Firing the pistol without hesitation, he aimed for Anthony's chest. Each bullet struck impacting with Anthony's body sending back step by step. Daniel emptied an entire clip into Anthony, expecting him to drop. When he didn't, Daniel dropped his sword and pulled a sawed-off shotgun hidden in his trench coat. This knocked Anthony off his feet. Firing round after round into him, Daniel did not stop until the gun was empty. At first, Anthony did not rise. His shirt and coat were a bloody mess. Daniel began to believe he might have actually succeeded in seriously hurting him. Flipping to his feet, Anthony pulled out one of the bullets embedded in his skin. Snarling, he looked at Daniel with pure hatred. Daniel could not even retrieve his sword before Anthony was upon him. Slicing and stabbing, Anthony took his time, taking Daniel apart. When it was over, blood was everywhere before Anthony finally began to drain him. Daniel didn't have the strength to resist him. For him, death was a welcome release to his suffering. When he had drained the last drop of blood, Anthony grabbed Daniel's head underneath the jaw and ripped his head off. Tossing the head away, he left the body where it lay. Anthony did not even bother to wipe the blood from his face as he strode away. Each bullet he ripped from his skin only further served to inspire his anger. Samantha woke in a car driving down a freeway. Where is my father and where are we going? Samantha asked her husband who was driving the car. He told me to get you and little Tony out of the city. He was still back there when we left, Lenny said. Leaning back, Samantha appeared to be ill. Concerned, Lenny pulled over to check on her. Samantha got out the passenger door and appeared like she was about to vomit. Getting out of the car, he went over to check on her. Are you all right? Lenny asked. Yes, I am, Samantha said, before nailing him with a right cross. 
Catching him before he slumped to the ground, she opened the door and put her unconscious husband in the passenger seat. Kissing her son, she left the car running and locked the doors, launching herself forward. Her surroundings began to blur as she headed back to L.A. as fast as she could. She was determined to see her father and stop what was about to happen. She arrived in time to see many lying dead. Members of all four races lay upon the ground, their faces full of shock and pain. Samantha had no question of who had killed. Each had been dispatched swiftly and efficiently. Most, she guessed, probably had not even seen the attack that had ended their existence in this world. From what her father had shown her, the vampire were supposed to have sided with him, but many of the bodies belonged to them. Continuing forward, she saw her father battle the last of those who would stand against him. The werewolf leader was a young man before he changed. Changing his shape, he howled. He probably expected her father to be afraid, but Anthony wasn't. He too changed his shape. Becoming a great beast, his body looked as strong as Samantha imagined he was in his other form. While he was not as large as the challenger, it soon became clear he was superior. Striking the challenger sought to rip Anthony's head off. Anthony dodged easily compared to his. The other werewolf's movements seemed sluggish. As strong as they were, they could not connect. Charging forward, Anthony ducked under his next swipe and gave a slash of his own. His claws opened a wound in the challenger's leg. Howling in pain, it tried to catch him, but only got another cut on its back. Limping, the challenger tried to mount a defense, but it was too late. Anthony leapt upon his back and bit into his spin, ripping it out. Tossing it aside, he let out a great howl, driving fear into his enemies. It was only as he looked to his daughter that his heart was stayed and thoughts of carnage left him. His strength and his mind returned his daughter's presence, lending him the strength he needed to regain his sanity. Changing back into a form resembling a man, his former self, but still so different. His body could barely contain his power. It trembled inside, bursting to get out. Samantha had brought him a much needed temporary reprieve. The trouble was, it was just that temporary. In time, the shadows would take him again. Now was the time to set things right for those who would follow him. Your leaders are dead. I rule in their stead now. Now there shall be peace, or I will return from my rest far beneath the earth and drink of your blood. Know now that should that time ever come, there will never be enough blood to sate my thirst and not one of you will survive. Choose now, obey, and support my line, and the peace or die now, Anthony said. Such was the vehemence of his voice that none doubted his word. They bowed before and accepted his peace because they dared not stand against him. He bade them leave and return home. Walking towards each other, father and daughter came face to face. Keep in mind what has happened here and the warning I gave. In time, your strength will come to match mine but it will take time. Pray that they are willing to wait that long. I do not foresee that this peace will last forever, but hopefully it will last just long enough. Remember your brothers and sisters, particularly Catherine's child. He will be the last hope after you. If you fail to bring me down, should I arise, then he must do it. Seek him out when the time is right and train him well, Anthony said. Does my future brother possess so much promise? I understand the blood of all rest in his veins, but he will be born human. How is he to make a difference? Samantha asked. Looking off in the distance, Anthony studied the night sky. Look deep inside yourself and you will see the answer to your question, Anthony replied. Doing just that, Samantha was shocked to see it was indeed there. The power in his blood can be awakened, Samantha said. Nodding, Anthony said, Unlike the others, your brother will be more like us. They will lean toward one species or the other, but he will dwell in the middle ground. It is there where he shall find the source of his strength, a perfect hybrid he can surpass all of us if allowed. What is more like you, he will be stable. That was my weakness, Samantha. For me, the change happened too quickly, the mutation too fast. My mind and my soul could not keep up. 
In time I will be consumed, and all you loved will be gone. I will see you all as food, not friend or foe nor kin, but the blood that I long for. Anthony said, reaching out and stroking her cheek softly before continuing, You have always been better than me. Without your conscience to guide me, I fell. But it was my decision. I protected my family. My only regret was the way I chose to do it. Farewell, my daughter, and enjoy this time of peace. Hug your child and love your husband as I loved your mother. I now go to sleep in places below where I shall rest until called. I will know when the peace has broken, for I will feel it. Do not forget your duty to your family. Embracing her father, Samantha released her tears, letting them flow freely down her face. I won't forget. I love you, father, Samantha said. Her father smiled and returned her words before they parted. He went to a group of caverns that he had already chosen and went inside. An avalanche soon followed and the entrance was sealed behind him. Samantha stood in that field for what seemed like forever. When she was ready, Samantha called her husband and told him where she was. Lenny came carrying little Tony. Taking him in her arms, she held her child close and looked at her husband lovingly. Lenny hugged her and the child, and they just stood there in the night air, and for that time Samantha felt safe and did not think of the dangers the future might bring.